uh, will come to the to the this this uh, uh, country, uh, country conference of uh, dedicated to to von uh, Neumann. Uh, I am very proud because huge interest, not only in, the, in this room, but, uh, but uh, uh, about uh, 100 people registered uh, in the online, online distribution. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for this huge interest. But I think it's is, is, uh, is dedicated to von Neumann and his, his, his uh, uh, work, not only, not only uh, for us. I am Imre Salai, the general manager of the, of the John, John von Neumann uh, society, and uh, we initiated this, this conference. I remember that exactly one year ago, we met the, the, the president of the, of the academy, uh, Professor uh, Tomasz Freund, and he supported this conference yeah, and, uh, and uh, started a one year long uh, work uh, to, to prepare this one. Uh, uh, he set up a, 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 a program committee and uh, the member of the committee uh, set up the program. They invited many, many uh, well-known uh, uh, presenters here. Thank you for uh, them, this, uh, this, this huge work. They have to, to, to organize this as a, as a professional and a, a contactful, uh, contentful uh, uh, conference. Uh, this year, uh, dedicated to von Neumann because uh, uh, this year is is uh, is a uh, uh, 120th uh, uh, anniversary of, of his uh, birth, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, John von Neumann Society uh, is working a, 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 a huge program, that prepared a huge program for this for this uh, year. Uh, yes, first of all, we we. Uh, managed to obtain this, this original, original copy of this, of this Financial Times, uh, what is, what is uh, 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 named him as a, as a man of the century because of, of, of his, his, his work. And definitely his, his brilliant work is, is really uh, influenced the, 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 the today and, the, and the maybe the, the, the future. Yes. Yes, the John von Neumann Society is established in, in uh, 1968, and uh, we bearing uh, Neumann name from this uh, uh, year. It means that we early uh, started to to to, to uh, remember and 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 work for his 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 uh, reputation. Uh, it was the first. Uh, a professional computer associate in, 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 in Hungary. Uh, today we are four, four different uh, 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 topics that we are, we are focusing. Uh, one is the, the, the uh, improve the digital competence, digital literacy in, 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 in Hungary is very important uh, uh, these days. Uh, we have naturally we have many many uh, professional. Uh, interest group uh, what is working different area of the of the computer uh, science uh, we, we are we are uh, uh, responsible for the for the all the all the uh, competition informative competition for student it means a, a very very huge talent uh, uh, development and and, uh, and uh, competition preparation work uh, uh, last week was in 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 in, in Seged, the, the 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 this year, Informatic Olympic for Worldwide Informatic Olympics, uh, and uh, we initiated uh, uh, this one, and we got the 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 the, the, the organization uh, possibility because of this this Neumann uh, 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 Memorial Year, and we have a, a, a very huge. Uh, Museum in Seged is co collecting all the all the computer and telecommunication equipment uh, from the from the beginning to 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 uh, today. Today's I, I think is a is a unique uh, unique uh, uh, museum because it includes not only the the, the 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 Western but the Eastern computers as well. And uh, and uh, the, or or society not only this year. Uh, keeping the, the memory of the of the John von Neumann, we have in this museum a, 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 a 
and, and Neumann room with original documents of, of, of uh, John von Neumann. Uh, there are many, many institutes uh, 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 has, has a Neumann name. We are co co uh, continuously uh, make a connection with them and working with them. Continuously we have, we have research, presentation on, on von Neumann uh, life and, and, and works. Uh, and uh, and uh, every year we have a, 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 a that laying process in the in the birth house of the of the Neumann. Uh, here is a, is a picture on on, on it. Um, and we arrived this this memorial year, and I some 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 uh, point I would like to show on, on from this day. First of all. Uh, some, some company and institute uh, supported this this year. This is uh, the reason that we are able to, to uh, organize a, 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 a number of, 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 of programs. Uh, it's very important. Uh, this is uh, the, the first uh, uh, exhibition in the, in the Foshori High School, where the, the Neumann and some other, other uh, uh, well-known uh, scientists uh, graduated. In this, in this uh, school, it was a so-called uh, milieu exhibition with the Neumann family furnitures and, and, uh, and painting and other, other reliquias. And, uh, and this is what the premiere of the, of the, of the uh, poster exhibition, but it will be a traveling uh, exhibition, is, is, is traveling in the countryside to show the, the normal life and works uh, everywhere in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Hungary. Uh, yes, very, it was uh, very, very interesting that uh, we uh, uh, asked for, for artists uh, to, to make a, a, a artworks uh, uh, homage, homage uh, on Neumann uh, uh, words, uh, and we got uh, about 130 uh, artworks, uh, and, uh, and fair of, of, of uh, exhibition uh, organized in this, in this year. And I only, only uh, mentioned this, 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 this uh, city post uh, exhibition in the, in the, in the city of the, of the, of the Budapest, or the other, other exhibition was uh, opened by Carico Catalin, and, uh, and, uh, and the artist was very, very happy to, to meet her. And on uh, and the other hand, the, the, the Carico Catalin got the, this year Neumann Professor uh, Award, that we established together with Hungarian uh, uh, Budapest uh, 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 Technical University. And uh, I think this is a very prestigious uh, award uh, because uh, uh, two uh, Nobel Prize winners, three Abel Prize winners uh, got already this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, award and hope that the, the Carico Catalin is a potential candidate for the next, uh, next uh, Nobel uh, Prize. Um, we, uh, issued a, 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 a nice uh, Willing Will al album by, by Istvan Hargitai and, and, and Balázs. Istvan is here and, and, and as I recognize that uh, somebody already, already uh, uh, dedicated or the, asked, asked for dedication from, from him. Uh, everyone uh, get a copy of this, of this, this book, uh, thanks to the Ministry of the, of the, of the Culture and uh, Innovation. They supported to, to provide these this books to the, to the audience here. And, uh, and uh, not only the, this book, but uh, we have a, a, a memorial medal but, uh, issued by the Hungarian National Bank. Uh, again, we can, we can if, if you are interested, we have some, some some uh, 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 coin here, and we can we can uh, give who somebody would like to 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 to, to buy this one. Uh, there is a so-called uh, Nobel uh, Prize winner park in in Balaton, Fülle. The Lake, Lake Balaton is a uh, well known in Hungary. There is this this park, and uh, we agreed the, the the major and the and the assembly of the of the of the town that uh, a Neumann Memorial Tree was printing in, 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 in June. I think, again, an extraordinary event that he 
uh, can all that. I would like to underline in not only the, the scientific uh, uh, approach, but would like to, to show the, the wider audience the, the importance of the, of the, of the von Neumann uh, uh, work. Yes, and, and only it was this only uh, some highlight of the of the of this year. If somebody interested in this in this homepage can can uh, recognize the, the past and the and the and the next uh, events uh, about about uh, hundred events uh, organized in this year. I think is a, I hope it is a is a is a good memory of the John von Neumann and his excellent uh, uh, work. Uh, in this in this uh, homepage, not only the event but we. Uh, is in, in we try to collect the, all the all the uh, uh, reports, uh, books, uh, uh, graphics, briefs, briefs, and others uh, what is as is uh, is, is uh, mentioned or, or show show uh, from Neumann. And this is the ambition that end of the year we have a, a complete complete uh, uh, collection of the of the of the memory of the of the of the. John von Neumann. This is a short overview that, that uh, this, uh, this how can we arrive this, this, this conference. I mentioned that, uh, that uh, thanks to the, the Hungarian Academy of Science, we are able to, to, uh, to have in this, in this nice environment, in this nice uh, uh, building, uh, and main patron of the conference of, of, of Tomás Fóin, the president of the, of the, of the, of the uh, Academy, and thanks uh, uh, to him. Uh, I, I think we, we can organize a, a very, very uh, contentful uh, uh, conference. Uh, and uh, here, is the, here is the program. The first, uh, uh, the first uh, the, uh, period, uh, some, some, some greeting and the, and the uh, overview of the, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, John uh, Neumann uh, works. And, uh, First of all, I would like to, to uh, invite you to this stage uh, to, to uh, uh, call our Peter, the general secretary of the, of the, of the academy, uh, who will make some op opening uh, thought on this, on this conference. He is, he is a, a, a Seychelles uh, Prize winner, a civil engineer, and, and uh, is very well known in the Hungarian uh, academy environment, uh, please. Thank you very much. Dear participants, uh, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, when I think of John von Neumann, the following story told me in the 90s that always comes to my mind. For Neumann making a derivation during a university lecture, he stopped and said, it is obvious. Is it obvious? Then he left the room, he returned 15 minutes later saying, yes, it's obvious. And he continued the lecture. I must add, that the story was told me at an American university where one building was named after the Hungarian mathematician Puya, and in those days there was an exhibition on another one, Segu. Well, searching the internet, you will find that the same story told in relation to several famous mathematicians. But for me, this story is about John von Neumann. And although the anecdote may not be authentic, it clearly reflects the admiration that is widely held for the genius of John von Neumann, who was born 120 years ago. The many stories, humorous anecdotes, and ideas attributed to von Neumann show that von Neumann's name is synonymous with the concept of the genius even among lay persons. However, it is not the reason that we have gathered here today at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Rather, because professional scientists also regarded him as a genius of exceptional brilliance and still do so today. 
The Hungarian mathematician Alfred Rényi had this to say about him. Mathematicians prove what they can prove. Von Neumann proves what he wants to prove. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear fellow researchers, at the first World Conference of Science Journalists held in Tokyo back in 1992, participants were asked to fill out a questionnaire to rank the scientists who they believed had the greatest impact on the 20th century. The result of the survey was that Einstein was placed first, Watson and Crick, the discoverers of the DNA double helix, came in second, and John von Neumann came in third, whose name was and still is associated with the word computer. And that's not surprising. After all, essentially, all our computers and mobile phones are based on the von Neumann architecture. But a genius can achieve greatness in any field, from mathematics to quantum physics, through game theory to the theory of intelligent, self-replicating automata. Von Neumann's output and contribution were outstanding. His essay, Can We Survive Technology, resonates with us today as a sort of von Neumann's prophecy, especially when we think of artificial intelligence and the prospect of the technological singularity. The science writer and von Neumann's biographer, Ananyo Batakharia, recently spoke about Neumann's genius in an interview. Quote, he brought his insight, rationality, and logical thinking to bear in an attempt to provide answers to questions that arose in countless fields. He always started from the facts, but he examined the world as a whole in its entirety." End of quote. This sort, short description not only sheds light on von Neumann's character, but on the universal and timeless duty of all scientists. In this sense, he's a great model for us all. The subfields of science cannot exist without others. During our own research work, we, man, we must constant, constantly refer to and interact with other fields which should have a major impact on our research. Dear colleagues, today's conference is one of the main events of the John von, John von Neumann 120 commemorative year, an event that has brought us together from all over the world out of a deep felt respect and admiration for the genius of John von Neumann. The Hungarian Academy of Sciences is delighted to be able to host this celebratory event and has, through the members of the section of mathematics and the section of engineering sciences, provided financial and professional support toward the high quality program of the John von Neumann Computer Science Society. Neumann's legacy is an obligation to ensure that our meeting today will be more than just a commemoration, but also an opportunity to look to the future purposefully and responsibly. You may ask, how can this be achieved at a conference? The answer may be that through interaction. And an example of someone who embodied this idea was John von Neumann himself, a man who besides possessing a superb intellect, was also a remarkable manager, someone who was able to work together with people of many different talents. An international conference is not only a forum for presenting the latest scientific facts and data, but can also be a fertile venue for personal interaction, for giving birth to scientific collaborations, interactions that have the potential to shape the history of science. There is a good example of just such an interaction in von Neumann's own life. 
when he had a chance encounter with Hermann Goldstein on the platform of a train station in the summer of 1944, an encounter that ultimately led to critical development in the computer. Before that encounter, von Neumann had seen several electromechanical computers, but he had no idea that the first fully electronic machine, the ENIAC, had been developed at the University of Pennsylvania. However, Hermann Goldstein, the young mathematician recognized von Neumann on the platform of the railway station, he walked up to him, engaged him in conversation, and mentioned the machine to him. From that moment, von Neumann became involved in the development of the computer, and today we know what a fundamental role he played in this process and just how important that machine has been in the history of mankind. Perhaps an international conference can function as a platform akin to the one at the train station back then. We have gathered here on this platform, if you will, from different parts of the world, from different subfields of our discipline, and before we set off on our individual journeys again, we have a chance to talk to each other by standing on this platform. And from our encounters and conversations with each other, something may be born that will still be discussed at a conference sometimes in the future. Dear ladies and gentlemen, John von Neumann loved intellectual encounters and we also know that he loved to read literature. And he especially loved Dickens. So allow me to conclude my greeting by paraphrasing Dickens. It is required of all persons that the spirit within them should influence their fellow men and their environment. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. Yes, for Neumann's genius is, re is reflected in the fact that he influenced his fellow men and women as well as his environment in his own lifetime. And then 120 years after his birth and nearly 70 years after his death, his influence is still being felt and is relevant today as indeed is shown by this very event that we are gathering at today. Thank you very much for your kind, kind attention. One more, more word, just I have to apologize because I have commitments at the university and I must go back there to de deliver a lecture with a few derivations. So thank you very much. Okay. I hope it's working already. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes the, the, uh, the, the next uh, greeting uh, uh, should be the, the, the Balázs Hanku, the, the, the State Secretary of the, of the uh, Ministry of the, of the Culture and Innovation, but uh, they have similar commitment to what the, what the uh, professor is saying. You know that uh, in, the, in the environmental sector, the, the, the higher powers has a, has a, uh, uh, has a call, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and the government guy should, should go. And therefore, uh, this morning, I got the, 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 the SMS from the, from the state secretary that, uh, that he is not able to, to attend. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, his, his, his uh, dedication to this conference showed that they supported to, to, to provide uh, you this, uh, this, uh, these books. I hope it is a, a good, good uh, sign of the, of, the, of the importance of this, of this, of this conference. Uh, the next uh, greeting will be on, on video. Uh, the Marina uh, von uh, Neumann Wittmann daughter of the, of the uh, uh, von, von Neumann, uh, sent, uh, sent uh, a short, uh, short uh, greeting uh, uh, to you. Uh, she is an economist. Uh, she is a professor of the, of the uh, Michigan uh, 
uh, University of Michigan, and uh, she was board member of many, many big corporations in USA, and, uh, and uh, uh, she was a, a consultant for the, for the President Nixon. Nixon. It means that uh, she is not only, not only the daughter of the Neumann, but uh, herself is an is a, is a eminent uh, 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 science, and uh, she uh, is a is a honorary uh, patron of the of this of this year. She knows all the event. We regularly inform inform her on this on this uh, on these things. Uh, and uh, please please uh, show the show the, the the video of 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 Magna. It's a pleasure to be asked to make a few opening remarks on this occasion of the 120th anniversary of my father, John von Neumann. Since he died so young at the age of 52, it's very hard for me to recognize that this is a hun the 120th legacy year, but I am very pleased that uh, his contributions are being recognized in this way so long after uh, he lived. And of course, I'm very grateful to you and your organization for making this possible. Okay, thank you. A nice greeting also in, in video is coming from the, from the Robert uh, De Graaf, uh, who is a past director of the, of the in, in, International Advanced Studies, and it was the, the, the institute where the Neumann works and a and, and, uh, and, uh, long uh, period. And, uh, and uh, Robert uh, De Graaf is today Minister of Education and Culture and Science in, 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 in Netherlands. And it is, uh, it is a very, and uh, he awarded the Spinoza Prize, what is the highest, highest uh, scientific uh, award in, in, the, in Netherlands. It means that he's a, again, is, is not only the, 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 the president of, uh, of institute and minister, but really a, 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 a scientist. The, the, this uh, this uh, internal advanced studies is in, in, in Princeton, US, uh, and established in, in 1930. And, uh, and, uh, and von Neumann worked there in from, from 1933, and he was uh, one of the first, first professors. Uh, among the other, other well-known uh, uh, sciences like Einstein, Oppenheimer, Gödel, and who emigrated from, from Europe to, to the US, uh, and it was a, as a, as a really a, a scientific and, 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 and theoretic center of the of the of the USA and and uh, uh, make some some advice and, and and development for the US government as well. Please uh, show the. Hello everyone. I'm going to be honest with you. A video of approximately two minutes is not nearly enough time to sum up what John von Neumann meant to the scientific world and to our society at large. He was a brilliant mathematician physicist and engineer, and his list of accomplishments in all of those fields is very long indeed. He established game theory, for instance, and built the foundations of quantum mechanics. I would even go so far as to say that von Neumann might have been a greater genius than Albert Einstein. He wasn't the only brilliant mind that Hungary brought forth during that time. Von Neumann belonged to a group of influential scientists known as the Martians. A joke by one of their members, physicist Leo Szilard, who once said that intelligent alien life is already among us. They just call themselves Hungarians. Eamon Flexner, the founding father of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, the United States, wanted to acquire some of this intelligent life, including John von Neumann, for his institute. A place where the greatest academic stars could ponder deep problems undisturbed, as far away as possible from everyday issues and practical applications. A place where you could go on an unhindered pursuit of knowledge. An academic paradise, where countless discoveries were made and I had the privilege to call home for several years. 
to walk the halls where von Neumann once could be found, to be in the same environment that inspired him all those years ago. It was there at the Institute that von Neumann and his team designed, built and programmed an electronical digital computer, ultimately laying down the internal infrastructure for our modern day computing devices. In fact, the building in which von Neumann developed that first modern computer, using the famous von Neumann architecture, now houses the Institute's nursery school. I always thought to be very fitting, since it's the place where computing also took its very first steps. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, around two minutes is simply not enough time to list all of von Neumann's accomplishments, to really capture what he meant for the scientific world. Thankfully, all of you have more time to reflect on his legacy today. And you not only get to look back, but also look ahead at all the technological innovations we currently have and what is to follow in the future. Looking at all those technological marvels building forth on von Neumann's work, we now need a GPS for the digital world more than ever. So please keep doing your important work and I hope you all have a wonderful and inspiring symposium. Uh, good to hear these both uh, videos because I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice word, it, including the, the, the general secretary as well. I think it was a, the, the nice opening of this conference and after this, this, uh, this greetings and opening speech, uh, we are turning to the, to the, the uh, presentation. The first uh, presenter is, is, is Miklos Redei who is a, a professor of philosophy at the London School of Economics and uh, Political Science. Uh, he is a, a, a specialist, specialist for the foundation and philosophical problems of the modern physics, uh, including the quantum mechanics and quantum field of, of, of uh, uh, theory. And he was co-director of the book uh, uh, titled John uh, von Neumann and the Foundation of the Quantum, uh, physics, uh, and uh, he is well known on the, on, the, on the editor of the John Neumann Selected Letters as well. Uh, Miklos, please. Uh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to talk uh, at this conference. It's a great honor, and it's a uh, privilege, and I'm very pleased to be allowed here to talk about John von Neumann's work. Talking about John von Neumann's work in general is a huge challenge. It's a scarily huge challenge, simply because his work is enormous, both in extent and in depth. So I, I do not really hope to be able to meet that challenge in a, in a very substantial manner, but I'm trying to do my best, and I'm going to try this according to this schedule and outline. First, I'd like to say a couple of words about von Neumann's uh, work in general, what, what type of work it was. These will be very general comments on von Neumann's work in general, and then saying something about von Neumann's attitude towards the Hilbert program. And this will be followed by some comments on what he did on the mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics. And in the second part of this talk, I will let von Neumann's contemporaries, colleagues, talk about what von Neumann did together with them on several issues in several fields, like the Manhattan Project. Hans Bethe will be speaking. I copied short video clips from the von Neumann documentary, which was prepared by the American Mathematical Society after von Neumann's death. And I will let uh, Hermann Goldstein talk about the Institute of Advanced Study Computer Development, and Oscar Morgenstern about von Neumann's work on game theory, and finally, uh, we will hear how Strauss, the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, talks about von Neumann as the advisor to the US government. This is the plan. I'd like to start by quoting 
Another Hungarian-born famous mathematician, Peter Lax, who writes in the foreword to the John von Neumann selected letters, which has already been mentioned, which I had the pleasure uh, to edit, the following. To gain a measure of von Neumann's achievements, consider that had he lived a normal span of years, he would certainly have been a recipient of a Nobel Prize in economics. And if there were Nobel Prizes in computer science and mathematics, he would have been honored by these two. So von Neumann should be thought of as a triple Nobel laureate, or possibly a three and a half fold winner for his work in physics, in particular quantum mechanics. Quite uh, serious words about the fellow mathematician, Peter Lex knew von Neumann personally. When he moved, Peter Lex moved to the US, he was introduced to John von Neumann. I also would like to quote from a possibly less well-known source, from the transcript of the hearings before the Senate of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, John von Neumann was interviewed by the Senate because he was appointed after the war as one of the Atomic Energy Commissioners, and that required confirmation by the Senate. And one of the senators, Senator Jackson, says the following about John von Neumann. I hope that your fertile mind, which is an invaluable resource of our country's security, will be used wisely by this country so that the full scientific talents which you possess can be fully exploited. I sincerely believe that our future security may well depend on the extent to which we exercise good judgment in using your scientific know-how. From what I know of your past record, it would indicate not only the great scientific and mathematical genius that you possess, but to my knowledge, a very unique arrangement that goes with it, good common sense and good judgment. These remarks by Senator Jackson, I think, are very important and indeed show that von Neumann was extraordinary, not in the sense only that he was a scientific genius, but that he had something else in addition to that, which doesn't fit well our stereotype of a great mathematician. The stereotype of a great mathematician is that he's a great mind, his analytic skills are extraordinary, but when it comes to practical, everyday matters, he's quite lost. He doesn't know what to do, or if he thinks he knows, but he doesn't. But von Neumann was very different. He, in addition to being capable of analyzing things in a very clear manner, systematic manner, he had an almost engineering-like attitude towards practical matters and also to everyday matters. And this is why he was sought after very extensively as an advisor. And if you have ever help, have a look at the von Neumann selected letter volume, you will see letters there in which he expresses his views in response to questions about all sorts of issues, like what would be a good place in a university structure of a computer science department? What should be the training of engineers like at Harvard University? What kind of arrangements should an institute like the Institute of Advanced Study put in place in order to regulate the working times of the scientists? All sorts of everyday managerial issues, and he was very willing to give advice, and we will see how this advice was appreciated by those who received them. Now, to von Neumann's work, properly speaking. When you have a look at what he did, and it, then you see that there are two strains of his work. <clears throat> on the one hand, there is the abstract, axiomatic one, and on the other hand, there is the very concrete and opportunistic one. The abstract axiomatic includes his work on axiomatic set theory, which was his PhD work, his work on the Hilbert program, <clears throat> and then his work in different subfields in mathematics, like measure theory, ergodic theory, about which we are going to hear later from Professor Sass, lattice theory, continuous geometry, spectral theory, uh, topological algebras. I'm going to say a bit more about these things. 
foundations of quantum mechanics and game theory. His work in these areas is very abstract and axiomatic. On the other hand, his work in computer development, numerical analysis, weather forecast, detonations, directed detonations in particular, weapons design, simulations and modeling in general, and consulting and advice is very concrete, very opportunistic, <clears throat> very down to earth. So there are these two uh, strains in von Neumann's work, easily uh, distinguishable. And what is remarkable in addition to that, that there is a great harmony between these two strains, by which I mean that his work in abstract mathematics is very non-speculative in some sense. We will see in what sense a bit later. It is informed, motivated, influenced frequently by science, by the problem situations in the sciences, by the potential application in the scientists, in the sciences, and by real world problems. On the other hand, the concrete, the opportunistic work is influenced by uh, the abstract thinking, by the abstract results, and this will become also, it is very clear when it comes, for instance, to the computer development. So two strains in general of von Neumann's work, the abstract, axiomatic, concrete, and opportunistic, but these are in great harmony. They influence each other in a very fruitful manner. And that, I think, is quite unique. I'm not aware of any mathematician or any scientist who would have embodied this kind of harmony to the extent he did. OK, now I'd like to uh, talk about some of his work in some specific fields. Von Neumann wrote his PhD on axiomatic set theory. Approaches to uh, axiomatic set theory were motivated by the crisis in mathematics at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, which were prompted by the famous paradoxes in naive set theory, for instance, the Russell's paradox. So von Neumann wrote his first substantial papers on axiomatic set theory, and a close related problem or issue which was motivated by the uh, paradoxes in naive set theory was the Hilbert program. Hilbert came up with the idea of somehow designing a language which is expressive enough to state all mathematics in it and show that in that language, in that logic, contradictions cannot be derived. Roughly, in a nutshell, this is the Hilbert program. In von Neumann's work, the Hilbert program is the following. Hilbert came forward with the following ingenious idea to justify classical pre-intuitionistic mathematics. Even in the intuitionistic system, it is possible to give a rigorous account of how classical mathematics operates. That is, one can describe how the classical system works, although one cannot justify its workings. It might therefore be possible to demonstrate intuitionistically that classical procedures can never lead into contradictions. It was clear that such a proof would be very difficult, but there were certain indications how it might be attempted. Had this scheme worked, it would have provided a most remarkable justification of classical mathematics on the basis of the opposing intuitionistic uh, system itself. And von Neumann himself worked on the Hilbert program. He tried to uh, accomplish it. But as it turned out, this program could not be accomplished. The turning point in the Hilbert program was the famous Königsberg conference in 1930 between the 5th and 7th of September, which von Neumann attended. He was one of the three major speakers who were addressing philosophical problems of mathematics. The other two speakers were Rudolf Carnap, the leading figure in the logical positivist movement in Vienna. The conference was organized by the logical positivists, by the Vienna group and the Berlin group. Carnap was talking about the logis uh, logical approach to logicism, the logical approach to mathematics. 
which attempted to reduce mathematics to logic. Heiting, the intuitionist uh, figure, was talking about intuitionism, and John von Neumann was talking about the Hilbert program, essentially. And it was in that conference that Gödel announced the first incompleteness theorem, which uh, von Neumann got interested in immediately. He pressed Gödel for further details. And a couple of weeks later, when he returned to Berlin, von Neumann at that time was a privat docent in Berlin, he wrote the following letter to Gödel. Dear Mr. Gödel, I have recently concerned myself again with logic using the methods you have employed so successfully in order to exhibit undecidable properties. In doing so, I achieved a result that seems to me to be remarkable. Namely, I was able to show that the consistency of mathematics is unprovable. When is your paper going to appear? The paper that is which is containing the first incompleteness theorem. And when are proof sheets going to be available? This is also of technical interest to me, as I would like to follow you as closely as possible, both substantively and notationally. And on the other hand, I would like to publish as soon as possible. Hoping for your answer by return mail and to see you again very soon. So for Neumann, in today's terminology, proved independently what is called the second incompleteness theorem of, of Gödel. And the reason why we call it the second incompleteness theorem of Gödel is because, unfortunately for von Neumann, by the time Gödel had received von Neumann's letter, he had already submitted his paper containing the second incompleteness theorem. And he wrote this to von Neumann, to which von Neumann replies in this letter, essentially a week later, November 29, 1930, many thanks for your letter and your reprint. As you have established the theorem on the unprovability of consistency as a natural continuation and deepening of your earlier results, I clearly won't publish on this subject. And he never did. He really never did. He regarded Gödel as uh, being an exceptional figure in the history of logic, compared him even to Aristotle. And he says, logic will never be the same again. Neumann continues, thus I think that your result has solved negatively the foundational question. There is no rigorous justification for classical mathematics. What sense to attribute to our hope, according to which it is de facto consistent I do not know. But in my view, that doesn't change the completed fact. A quite remarkable moment, both in the life of Neumann and also, I think, in the history of mathematics, when the leading mathematician of the age, in view of these two theorems, especially of the second one, which he himself also proved, to the question, what is your reason to believing that classical mathematics is OK, he says, I have no idea. Quite remarkable, I think. For Neumann also expressed this view, namely that the incompleteness theorems of Gödel mean the end of the Hilbert program, in another letter from which I would like to quote, which he wrote to Rudolf Carnap about half a year later, in which Carnap and Neumann discuss the proceedings of the Königsberg conference. And then von Neumann says, I'm today of the opinion that first, Gödel has shown the unrealizability of the Hilbert program. And second, there is no more reason to reject intuitionism. And he adds to it, which I think is remarkable. I hope there are not many intuitionists here in the room. He says, if one disregards the aesthetic issue, which in practice will also for me to be the decisive factor saying essentially that intuitionism is ugly, and I'm not going to follow it because it binds my hands, and I'm going to proceed in my mathematical research on the assumption that classical mathematics and pure existence proofs, for instance, are OK, as long as someone displays a contradiction in the foundations. 
Therefore, I consider the state of the foundational discussion in Königsberg to be outdated, for Gödel's fundamental discoveries have brought the question to a completely different level. I know that Gödel is much more careful in the evaluation of his results, but in my opinion, on this point, he does not see the connections correctly. I would like to emphasize nothing in Hilbert's aims is false. Could they be carried out, then it would follow from them absolutely what he claims. But they cannot be carried out. This I know only since September 1930. Another remarkable part of this letter is, uh, which is a separate story, namely that von Neumann says here that Gödel views his results slightly differently. Gödel didn't think at that time that the incompleteness theorems are a death spell for the Hilbert program. Gödel was much more careful, but later on he changed his mind and he accepted essentially von Neumann's position. And it's an interesting question to which I don't really have the answer why von Neumann and Gödel at that time disagreed so strongly, but there is evidence that they, they, they disagreed very substantially. So this is von Neumann's uh, story with respect to the Hilbert program, very abstract mathematics. And from the failure of the program, von Neumann drew a very strong conclusion. Namely, he took the position that mathematical rigor is not a priori, it is historically changeable. Quote from a paper which is von Neumann's only paper in which he explicitly addresses philosophical issues related to mathematics, The Mathematician, Collected Works, Volume 1, if you're interested. He says there, the variability of the concept of rigor shows that something else besides mathematical abstraction must enter into the makeup of mathematics. And he adds to this that some of the best inspirations of modern mathematics, I believe the best ones, clearly originated in the natural science. So for Neumann, partly as a result of the failure of the Hilbert program, embraces a concept of mathematics or a view of mathematics, if you want to call it a philosophy of mathematics, you might want to do that, which is empiricist to a large degree, which is a bit surprising in view of his very abstract work on axiomatic set theory, but this is the conclusion he came to from the 1930s on. So he views mathematics not as something a priori, but something which emerges from our dealing with nature and with society as well. And when we are intending to describe nature and social phenomena in a quantitatively precise manner, we are led to creating mathematical concepts which are suitable for that. This is how mathematics, in his view, emerges. This is a view of mathematics which was not shared very widely, not even by his close colleagues. It is very well known that Wigner, for instance, had a different view of mathematics. On the basis of von Neumann's empiricist-leaning mathematical concept, it's not surprising, is it, that mathematics is applicable in natural sciences, because it's coming from there. How could it be otherwise? It's not at all surprising. Whereas Wigner famously said that the <coughs> applicability of mathematics in the natural sciences is very close to a mystery which we cannot explain, and he added, which we also do not deserve. So this is not a an easily embraceable, not an easily acceptable position, but that was his position. And this position influenced also his mathematical work. And this is what I meant by his even abstract mathematical work not being speculative. Many of what he, a lot of what he did in abstract mathematics was motivated by the problems in the sciences or by the problems of the social world. Quantum mechanics and game theory are prime examples of this. And I'm going to talk about this a bit later, but before then, one more quotation which I think is interesting 
because it, it is a sort of advice which is still valid today for practicing mathematicians, and I do see some practicing mathematicians here in the audience. For Neumann's uh, empirical attitude towards mathematics includes the following advice. As a mathematical discipline travels far from its empirical source, or still more, if it is a second and third generation only indirectly inspired by ideas coming from reality, it is beset with very grave dangers. It becomes more and more purely aestheticizing, more and more purely larkular, and this is, need not be bad if the field is surrounded by correlated subjects which still have closer empirical connections. But there is a grave danger that the subject will develop along the line of least resistance, that the stream so far from its source will separate into a multitude of insignificant branches, and that the discipline will become a disorganized mass of details and complexities. In other words, at a great distance from its empirical source, or after much abstract inbreeding, a mathematical subject is in danger of degeneration. Whenever this stage is reached, the only remedy seems to me to be the rejuvenating return to the source, the reinjection of more or less directly empirical ideas. Very clear talk. It's a kind of advice for mathematicians to be aware of a danger which he regarded as a great danger. A prime example of von Neumann's work, which was motivated by the empirical sciences, is his work on the mathematical foundations of quantum theory, which I'd like to talk about now in the next part. His work on the mathematical foundations of quantum uh, theory can, uh, consists of two periods. The first period is between 1926 and 1932. The 1926 uh, is the year when von Neumann goes to Göttingen to work as Hilbert's assistant on the Rockefeller Fellowship, apparently with the intention of pursuing <coughs> the Hilbert program further. And 1932 is the year when his famous book on the mathematical foundations of one mechanics is published by Springer University. But when von Neumann arrived in Göttingen in 1926, in that academic year, Hilbert was lecturing on the mathematical foundations of quantum theory. And it was customary at that time that the assistant of the professor was sitting in the lecture, took notes, and on the basis of these, they made joint publications. And this is what happened also to John von Neumann. And they, uh, Hilbert, him, and another assistant, Nordheim, wrote a joint paper on the mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics. It was published in 1926. And this was, this was a remarkable paper for two reasons, at least. First, because that was the first attempt to axiomatize quantum mechanics. Remember that quantum mechanics was being born around this time. It was a very fresh, young discipline at that time. And <clears throat> this paper was an attempt to axiomatize quantum mechanics. That was the first attempt. And it was published in the Mathematische Annalen, which was the leading journal in mathematics. So the first remarkable thing about the paper is that this is the first axiomatization. The second remarkable feature of that paper is what is at the very end of the paper, in which the authors say that I'm paraphrasing, not quoting. We are not entirely sure that what we are make, doing here makes sense, but it's mathematically meaningful. This is what they explicitly say, which is, I think, quite surprising. And then they also say that we hope to return to some of these issues in later publications, and they refer to a forthcoming paper by John von Neumann on mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics. <coughs> And von Neumann published then, after this uh, joint paper, three papers in which he was the sole author, in which he worked out what we call the Hilbert space formalism of quantum mechanics. And I'm summarizing this here. In today's terminology, I'm not entirely faithful to the original uh, <clears throat> system 
in terminology here. <clears throat> the main point is that it is because of von Neumann's work in the 1920s on the foundations of quantum mechanics that we think of quantum mechanics today as non-commutative probability theory. And what this means that the classical concept, that the concepts of classical probability theory, which are in blue on the left-hand side, are replaced by quantum counterpart. There is a very strong correlation, a very nice analogy between classical and quantum probability theory. Classical probability theory <clears throat> is uh, a triplet, essentially. You have the set of elementary events. You have a certain set of subsets, a set of certain subsets of the set of elementary events, which is a Boolean algebra. In general, it's a sigma field. And the probability measure is a map on that sigma field into the 0, 1 interval that gives you the probability. Random variables, which are defined on the set of elementary events and say take values in the <coughs> set of real numbers, <coughs> are measurable functions. And there is a particular type of them, which, are, which is the bounded measurable functions. The quantum counterpart of these concepts, instead of a Boolean algebra, you take the lattice of projections of an abstract Hilbert space. A quantum state will be a generalized probability measure on this projection lattice. And linear operators correspond to random variables and bounded operators to bounded uh, random variables. What did von Neumann do in connection with this picture of what quantum mechanics is? It was him who, in his first paper on the mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics, isolated the notion of abstract Hilbert space. It's really recommended to have a look at that paper. It's a beautiful example of how <clears throat> mathematical generalization takes place by a great mind having a look at particular representations of a structure and isolating what seems to be common in them and fixing them at, uh, axiomatically. It's, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And I think it's been translated into Hungarian as well. <clears throat> so he created the notion of abstract Hilbert space. Side remark, he also demanded the Hilbert space to be separable, which nowadays is not part of the definition of the Hilbert space. And he started the investigation of the set of projections on an abstract Hilbert space. He also saw that they do not satisfy the distributivity law with respect to the lattice operations. But in the finite dimensional case, they have a weakened form of distributivity, the modularity property. And in the infinite dimensional case, they don't even satisfy that property, but another one, which is a later terminology, automodularity. The, crew, the, the key ingredient in this analogy is, however, what is called the spectral theorem, which von Neumann proved. This allowed the identification of the linear operators with uh, random variables. You recall that the random variable in a classical probability theory is a random variable because it's a measurable function, which means that the inverse image function is a homomorphisms from the homomorphism from the Borel set, Borel sigma algebra, into the Boolean algebra, which is the domain of the specification of the probability measure. What von Neumann proved, and this is the content of the spectral theorem, is that linear operators can be identified with homomorphisms from the Borel field into the, not Boolean algebra this time, but the projection lattice. This was quite remarkable because that was the neurologic point which was missing from the Hilbert von Neumann Northern paper. This is the problem of the, the eigenvalue problem could not be solved there properly. In terms of the spectral theorem, the eigenvalue problem was solved completely. And this allowed, von Neumann emphasizes this, the treatment of the discrete and the continuous spectrum in a unified manner, and this made quantum mechanics essentially free of mathematical contradictions. So this was the main achievements of the 
1920s on the foundations of quantum mechanics. These were summarized in the book published by Springer in 1932. And I'd like to quote now from Neumann showing you how he himself thought about the nature of this foundational work. He writes the following in a letter to Serker. Serker was the president of Dover Publications, and von Neumann was negotiating the English translation of his originally German mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics by Dover. <clears throat> von Neumann writes, the subject matter is partly physical mathematical, partly, however, a very involved conceptual critique of the logical foundations of various disciplines theory of probability, thermodynamics, classical mechanics, classical statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics. This philosophical, oops, this philosophical epistemological discussion, philosophical epistemological discussion, has to be continuously tied in and quite critically synchronized with the parallel mathematical physical discussion. It is, by the way, one of the essential justifications of the book, which gives it a content not covered in other treatises written by physicists or by mathematicians on quantum mechanics. So von Neumann points out here what he takes to be the unique feature of his work on the mathematical foundations. And this is, in my formulation, this is mathematical physics. It's not mathematics, simply. It's not physics, simply. It's mathematical physics. And by being mathematical physics, it's very close to philosophy. I hope you forgive me and you don't consider this as a chauvinism on my part when I say the importance of philosophy in connection with this. But this, this is von Neumann saying explicitly, it's to a large extent philosophical. I would even be willing risking being provocative to say that mathematical physics is the technically explicit philosophy of physics. If you press me hard on this, I might back up and say, OK, I don't want to say this. But for the sake of the argument, I might risk this statement. So this work was very philosophical, was very conceptual, was very unique, and it was mathematical physics with philosophical flavor. So mathematics was put, uh, sorry, quantum mechanics was put into order without mathematical contradictions in 1932. However, there was another period here between 1932 uh, uh, and 1954. For Neumann writes in a letter to Gerrit Birkhoff in November 1935, I would like to make a confession which may seem immoral. I do not believe absolutely in Hilbert space anymore. What did he believe then? What did he want to replace the beautifully developed Hilbert space formalism of quantum mechanics? This is a very, very long and very technical story. I would like to, again, just summarize what I take to be the main point. In the 1930s, von Neumann started working on the theory of von Neumann, what are called von Neumann algebras today. So instead of replacing classical probabilistic concept with the Hilbert space quantum mechanics, Hilbert space probability theory concepts, he suggests replacing a Boolean algebra not by a von Neumann lattice, uh, not by a Hilbert lattice, but by a von Neumann lattice, lattice of projections of a von Neumann algebra, a quantum state should again be a countably additive map on the projection lattice into the zero one interval. And linear operators should be again identified with those spectral measures, homomorphisms, which have the feature that their range is in the projection lattice. And the rest is the same. This idea is based crucially on the notion of the von Neumann algebra, which is a subalgebra, star subalgebra of the set of all bounded operators, which has the feature that it is closed with respect to a weaker topology than the uniform operator topology. Von Neumann initiated the study of these algebras in the late 1920s, and he proved at the crucial theorem about this, the von Neumann double commutant theorem, which I'm not stating here except to say that it was remarkable and beautiful because it characterized topological closeness in terms of an algebraic property 
which is very surprising, uh, I think, for a mathematician. Um, what is the significance of this? So this is a general non-classical probability theory now replacing the Hilbert space formalism. And the significance of this is that just like classical measure theory provides all the types of classical probability measure spaces, the von Neumann algebra theory provides all the types of non-classical, non-commutative probability spaces. And this is via the classification theory of the Murray von Neumann, which was published in 1935. So the significance of this moving beyond the Hilbert space formalism is that we are now having a framework in which all types of non-classical, non-commutative probability spaces are possible, very much like classical measure theory provides all the types of classical probability spaces, all the types of classical measure spaces. They are listed here. I'm not going to go through them. And the slogan is then that for Neumann algebra theory is essentially non-commutative measure theory. So for Neumann should be viewed as the non-commutative Kolmogorov. That's the slogan in terms of which you can understand this work, the second phase of von Neumann's work on quantum theory. But this is not even the end of the story. One, in, in retrospect, one can say that at the time when von Neumann was working on this, it was mainly mathematically motivated, but these structures have become totally indispensable in today's mathematical physics. These different quantum probability spaces are absolutely indispensable in describing in a mathematically precise manner quantum systems which have infinite degrees of freedom. It's just not possible to describe them. Typical, those systems are the infinite Ising model, the ideal Bose gas, and also relativistic quantum field theory is such that the algebras of observables associated with certain space-time regions are provably such type that they do not fit into the Hilbert space formalism. Okay? So von Neumann created here something in the 1930s which became absolutely indispensable later on in the late 1950s, early 1960s, and also, mathematically, the von Neumann algebra theory is extremely deep. This is regarded von Neumann's major contribution to mathematics. The problems which he formulated, which he started working on, led to several Fields medals and Wolf medals. So, created a field which is extremely rich, extremely deep, and physically indispensable, indispensable in physics. How much time do I have? Can I, am I allowed to speak more? Because five minutes. Oh, that's a disaster. Um, let me skip then the next slide, although I think it's very interesting. Uh, let's just talk about uh, von Neumann's war work. And here I'm going to let others speak instead of me. That will be more interesting, I'm quite sure. It's well known that von Neumann contributed to the war effort of the uh, US government in different ways as a consultant. Here are some of the consulting positions which he had. And in particular, he was making major contributions to the Manhattan Project. And I would like now to let Hans Bethe talk about von Neumann's contribution to the Manhattan Project. Von Neumann took part in most of the crucial stages of the bomb's development and was present at the detonation of the first A-bomb at the Trinity site. Nobel Prize winner Hans Bethe, leader of the Theoretical Physics Division in Los Alamos, 1943 to 1946. In Los Alamos, in 1943, we had the problem of assembling uranium to make an atomic bomb. Uh, Dr. von Neumann was a consultant to the laboratory and visited us about th 
three times a year for a week or two at a time. There were two methods being considered. One was to shoot the parts of the bomb together by a gun, and the other method was the so-called implosion, in which you surround the bomb material by high explosive and then explode this, this explosive so that the metal of the bomb would assemble in a sphere. Uh, in the beginning of the Los Alamos laboratory, only the first method seemed to be possible. It was von Neumann who told us and encouraged us to try the second and who gave us a lot of information on similar work which had been done at, under his uh, supervision at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland in which shaped charges had been developed. He was very positive that an implosion could be developed and he uh, told us that this would have added advantages for the assembly which we had not realized. One of the advantages which we had realized was that the implosion would bring the material together much faster and therefore would prevent detonation of the weapon before full assembly. Another advantage which he pointed out was that the implosion might squeeze the material and might thereby increase the efficiency of the weapon. Even after his encouragement, however, we still found it very difficult to assemble the uh, material by implosion. There were experiments made under the leadership of Dr. Kistiakowski of Harvard to uh, study the explosive method uh, without the uranium being around. And uh, unfortunately, they gave all sorts of irregular shapes. Well, this did not trouble von Neumann at all. He suggested to us that we use something to focus the implosion, focus in a similar way as light is focused by a lens. And this device, in fact, has been called an explosive lens. Afterwards, he designed for us some configuration of explosive lenses which actually worked and which was finally used in the assembly that we uh, used for the first bomb in Trinity and afterwards in Nagasaki. Very crucial contribution. And after the war, <clears throat> the computer design was in von Neumann's main interest, and he convinced the leadership of the Institute of Advanced Study to be home of the computer development, and this project was carried out successfully between 46 and 52. And here are some pictures, well-known pictures, which were taken uh, in front of the computer. Oppenheimer is there in front of the computer. He was the director of the Institute of Advanced Study. And here, John von Neumann, very proudly standing by his brainchild, in a sense. And here is uh, how Hermann Goldstein describes von Neumann's major contribution to the project. This machine was the concrete embodiment of von Neumann's very great ideas and contributions which he has made to the electronic computer field. In 1946, Johnny asked me if I would join him at the end of the war in Princeton and help him to carry out in concrete form the ideas which he had been working on in 1944 and 1945. Of course, I jumped at the chance. We rushed to Princeton and got started. The machine that eventuated from that is the one you see here, and it contains essentially those things which the modern computer has in it, although in somewhat primitive form. This machine has stored program concept as its major feature, and that, in fact, is the thing which makes the modern computer revolution possible. The older machines, required one to clumsily 
perform hand pluggings of connections which took hours, indeed days. It meant that programming was an art, in fact, a very black art. And furthermore, it meant that the total number of instructions one could write were comparatively small. This new concept has been carried so far today that programs are written involving tens of millions of instructions. Whereas in those days, of course, nobody dreamed of such complexity, but Johnny's idea made this basically possible. What is this stored program concept? Well, it's the notion that you can describe in a finite number of words, in fact, a fairly small number of words, in a fairly simple language, exactly and unequivocally the description of a problem. And that this description is then translated into binary digits and stored in the memory of the computer exactly as numbers are stored. This was the discovery by Johnny. You may say, what's so remarkable about that? Well, the only thing I can tell you in answer to that is it's just like the wheel. What's so remarkable about the wheel? When you look at it, you can't conceive how anybody would not have known that there was one. Indeed, it must have been that the moment somebody mentioned the wheel or somebody mentioned the stored program, everybody around us obviously knew that this was the way to do it. And in fact, we accepted it immediately. It was not one of these inventions or discoveries which is enormously complicated and few people can understand. It's tremendously simple. It immediately hit, hits a person and he knows that's it. Now, this, I believe, was his great discovery. OK. So there are uh, three more clips. Uh, I wouldn't like to abuse your patience. I would like to show you, however, Louis Strauss' very short video uh, in which he talks about von Neumann as an advisor, significance of him as an advisor. And in the very end, there's a bonus video, very short, in which von Neumann is speaking. So if you allow me that kind of extra time, then I would like to do that. And I skip the video clip in which Oscar Morgenstern talks about his association with John von Neumann. So I'm skipping that. This is the, this is the Louis Strauss, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, talking at, about von Neumann as an advisor. Admiral Louis Strauss, chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission during that period. I, rem I remember one particular incident at uh, Walter Reed Hospital, the Army Hospital, here in Washington, when the Defense Department felt that it had to consult him. He was their chief scientific advisor on Air Force matters. And I recall the extraordinary picture of sitting beside the bed of this man in his 40s, who had been an immigrant. And there surrounding him were the Secretary of Defense, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Secretaries of Air, Army, Navy, and the Chiefs of Staff. Quite impressive how important he was, how eager people in this size of power, decision power, were to listen to him, to his advice. Quite extraordinary. And finally, <clears throat> after some At the picture, time of his death, John von Neumann's, Neumann's speaking. peers considered him among the world's greatest living mathematicians. Yet he was virtually unknown to the general public. A year-long search for film material turned up only these excerpts from a 1955 TV program Youth wants to know, in which all that the young participants knew about him was that he was an AEC commissioner and a very polite and patient man. <laughs> Bill, did you have a quick question there? We be, have been seeing all these uh, uh, mechanical instruments and everything, and what, how are they educating more people to operate these instruments? Is there enough 
people to do it? Or I'm, glad that that you're, I'm glad that you're asking this question because it's really a very good one. No, we don't have enough people and we better do something about it. And I hesitate to say that we better do something about it quickly, but rather we better do something about it both quickly and then continuously. In other words, we need more training in science on all levels in college, in the high schools, and more training of high school teachers all along the line will have to accelerate a great deal. Bill, do you think you might get into that sort of field? No, huh? sir, I'm sort of interested in law a little bit. He's, from, he's our lawyer from, from Arkansas, Dr. Van You're not going to be it's an engineer, huh? Do you think that uh, more uh, scholarships uh, would help a whole lot if we had a whole lot more scholarships? Yes, more scholarships would be very important and would be very helpful. But you must also remember that the scholarships help you only at the end of this process. And that before this, one needs very good training in secondary schools. Otherwise, you may never discover that you have that ability. Uh, also, one needs more training of science teachers for high, for the high schools, because otherwise, the high schools never get to that point. So it will have to affect a whole lot of things. I think this advice is even valid today. More teaching, more high school teachers, very well trained ones, especially in the field of sciences and mathematics, would be very much needed. So he's, ad he's ad very much alive. His advice was very clever, and we'd better listen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for accepting the, the invitation and, and the, this nice presentation on the, on the, on the exciting moment of the of the of the of the fun moment, and and would like to uh, in, the, in the in front of audience to give this this uh, Neumann uh, medal for you for thank this presentation. Very much appreciated. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank thank you. You. Let's continue. We are continuing the, the conference, that uh, new interesting uh, presentation. In, the, in the, this, this section, the first, first presenter is Professor I, I, Abraham Neyman, who is, uh, who is Professor Emeritus of Mathematics uh, uh, at the Hebrew University, as I know. And uh, he is served as president of the, of the Israel chapter of the, of the game. Uh, Society and uh, has been fellow in the Economic uh, Society as well, and he also held position in the visiting scholar at Cornell University, University of the California at Berkeley, and Stanford University. Please, your stage is here. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure an honor to speak in a conference of my scientific hero, John von Neumann. Uh, the topic is a topic in stochastic game, in the game theory, which is called stochastic games. And later, it will be clear why I choose this particular uh, topic. And it's always good to start a talk with an outline, because when I talk on the outline, I give uh, highlights of few points that will be mentioned. And usually, we are used to the fact that we don't always go all the way to the end, so at least you would know what we are missing. So, von Neumann was a founding father of many scientific disciplines. One of them is definitely game theory. Yes. And he basically contributed in, two, in three different connecting areas in game theory. Often, nowadays, people are either handling the first, or the second, or the third. And those three topics were strategic games, which were studied and introduced in von Neumann's paper in 1928. Then cooperative games, which are in the book by von Neumann and Morgenstern, uh, 1944. And 
Another component there is the issue of cooperative strategic games, basically to try to incorporate those two theories together to start from the strategic games, moving to the cooperative game, and then making the analysis of these games. The presentation today is a journey from von Neumann's 1928 paper, which mark the birth of the mathematical theory of games to the development of the modern theory of stochastic game. So obviously, I say the mathematical theory of games, but this mathematical theory of games that he initiated was the foundation of many applicable future works. And if we think of the impact of his work and the follow-up, there are at least 12 dozen people that got the Nobel Prize for work in game theory, in economics, the Nobel Prize in economics. So there are a few instances of earlier work that used game theory. One is Cournot, 1938, Zermelo from 1913, which I'll describe explicitly what Zermelo did, and Borel, 1921, which I may mention something, but uh, let's just say that he was trying to do what von Neumann did in his paper 1928, but basically he conjectured that something is false, which von Neumann proved it's correct. <laughs> so we will focus in this talk only on follow-ups of his work on the Minimax theorem from 1928. And in this work, he basically did three conceptual and technical contrib contribution. One is defining what is a game. Yes. He, he knew that people are playing poker, chess, soccer, uh, competition between firms, etc. But to formalize it as a mathematical concept, what is a game? Tell me the story. The story of the game could be highly complicated, but make of it, make out of it a simple thing. And then once you get into this fact of what is a game, you understand what it is, you understand what is a strategy in a game. Yes, A strategy of a game is a method of how to play the game. Any instances, what you know, what you don't know, take an action as a function of what evolved so far in the game. And then come a brilliant idea that says the way that we are going to analyze this game is basically we could think a priori what is a strategy. There is a strategy of each player. And if we pick a strategy of each player, then we could follow up and see what will be the outcome of the game. The outcome could be probabilistic because there might be some chance moves, but we could compute it. And then we can model the entire situation as a kind of a simultaneous move game where each player is picking up his strategy. It's worth mentioning that in Borel, Borel had this intuition as well, but he has summarized it in only one sentence, and it's not clear but he didn't define formally what's a game, so uh, obviously the birth of this theorem is a uh, von Neumann 1928 paper. So his paper was called On the Theory of Games of Strategy, and it contains four, just this single paper, I say there are three parts of his contribution, four fundamental contri contributions. The first is the description of a game of strategy including who are the players. We'll see that there could be here some confusion from our intuition as laymen. Second, so this first one describes many games like chess, poker, quickspiel. Probably you don't know what's quickspiel, but it's a very interesting game, strategic game, world playing, and uh, and as well as a competition among firms, nations, animals, and the various auction mechanisms, and nowadays auctions take such a large part in the real life days that people don't know that there are auctions in trillions of dollars almost daily. 
The second is the definition of a strategy of a player in a game. So you describe the game, the formal thing, and then you have to define what is a strategy. The third is the description of the game of strategy as a one-shot, simultaneous move game. So you have to think of it as before and each one puts in a box his strategy, a referee looks on the strategies and now starts to play and follow the game according to this strategy. The fourth is the minimax theorem. Once you have this formalization, then you have what's called the minimax theorem. The minimax theorem is extremely important in economics, but served also as a mathematical tool to solve few old open problems later in the days. But one has to think of it in a, in a smart way. So I said this is the minimax theorem of von Neumann, this paper, where we will start. Then I'll move to stochastic games. These games were introduced by another, another uh, not another, the first that I mentioned here, Nobel Prize winner, Shapley, in 53. And this was a paper that was communicated to the proceeding of the National Academy of Science by von Neumann. I think it's the first paper that von Neumann communicated in game theory after his war to the proceeding of the National Academy of Science. And I will try to describe what is a stochastic game. In the first part, where I speak about the minimax theorem, I would build the minimax theorem, the story behind the minimax theorem, in a format that will be suitable for my definition of what is a stochastic game. So it will follow similar lines, so it will be easier to follow. Then the first paper of Shapley was proving that the discounted stochastic game and uh, proved there an existence of a minimax theorem for that particular game. I should say a priori that in the initial theory of von Neumann of the minimax theorem and the development, all the games were finite. So they were eventually finitely many strategies. In this theory of stochastic game, we will see that there are infinitely many strategies, even though the game itself could be described by finitely many parameters. So the finiteness comes from the description of the game, but the strategy themselves becomes infinite strategies. Then I will illustrate examples of stochastic games. These examples will be specially tailored for also for explaining what is the game and also to explain to mathematicians some of the difficulties that arise in stochastic games. Then I will present a result about the existence of the undiscounted value in stochastic game. So in general, in the stochastic game, the play of the game results in a sequence of payoffs to each player. So the player gets a sequence of payoffs. And the question is, if you look on the entire game, what is the payoff of the entire game? So if you look on the payoff of the entire game as a long-run average of the payoffs in the one games, that's called the undiscounted game. And the issue whether there exists a value for this game, a minimax theorem for this game, was open for quite some time and settled eventually by uh, Mertens and myself. Then we will switch to the Nash equilibrium theorem, Nash 51. A theorem, a very short paper, a masterpiece. Nash got the Nobel Prize in economics just essentially for this paper. There is almost no paper in economic theory nowadays that doesn't use the concept of the Nash equilibrium theorem. And if we go back to von Neumann, von Neumann, I didn't met von Neumann, but I was a good close friend to Nash. And uh, uh, so the story from Nash, when he came with the theorem to von Neumann and he showed him, he said, oh, that's a fixed point generalization of the min-max theorem. So immediately I've seen, the, when he explained him the result, the proof of the result and what is the meaning, but he didn't formalize that in his own paper studying competitive games. And then we will move 
since we have the concept of an equilibrium, we'll describe what is a non-zero sum stochastic game. So in a zero sum, in a competitive stochastic game, one player maximizes something, and player two is the adversary who tries to minimize this payoff. And then we will define the undiscounted equilibrium in this type of game. And for the mathematicians in the audience or in the online, I, in honor of another great uh, Hungarian mathematician, Paul Erdes, who used to pose up po open problem and offer prices for this problem. So I will, one of the objectives of this talk is to pose an open problem about undiscounted equilibrium in stochastic A, for which I offered already many years ago uh, a prize, which is a dinner in any restaurant in the world, including transportation, if the solution is positive, and a dinner without transportation, if the solution is <laughs> negative. So you are all invited to work on this thing. And I would say that the, the, the initial problem that I posed, the one that I'll pose here, I wouldn't have enough time to describe the general problem, but this is a Watertown down version. But still, I would give these prices for this Watertown versions that I'm posing here. And then we will close, if there will be time, to discuss on uh, three different theories of stochastic gain, the asymptotic, uniform, and robust theories of stochastic gain. The asymptotic value, a theory developed initially by Bewley and Kohlberg, which looks on the solution of the game. You have a solution of the game, and you try to see there will be various ways of evaluating streams of payoffs, and you want to see if the, when the players become more patient and more patient, does the solution converge to a limit? This is the Julian Kohlberg result there. The uniform value, which was initiated by the work of Mertens and mine, was not only to show that these values converge, but that there is one single strategy that a player could utilize simultaneously, optimizing simultaneously for all the stochastic games with sufficiently patient players. And the final thing is the robust solution of finite stochastic game that try to show how in a family of stochastic game you could vary your optimization in a continuous way, in a uniformly continuous way. So, Let's go back to the first part. For Neumann, somebody said here that he lived 52 years in one of the seminars, but my computation is 54, right? <laughs> I think in one of the lectures there was. So he's the father of game theory, and as I said, is the Minimax theorem, the competitive in 1928, and then the two other subjects by von Neumann with, together with Morgenstern, which I was hoping to hear the quote from Morgan Stern on that, so I'll get it privately later, uh, what he said about him uh, on his view. Another important Hungarian American contributor to this theory is Arsani, who also got the Nobel Prize for his contributions in game theory. So we already mentioned two. I wouldn't mention all the 12, but uh, we have those two. And as I rem remember that this contribution has three components. What is a game, what is a strategy, and the minimax theorem. And when we describe what is a game, in particular, what is a player in a game? Okay? So let's look on a few examples of players. Okay? You have two, at least two great uh, Hungarian chess players, Judith Polgar and yeah. Lajos Potish, who are still alive. I think there is one even greater chess player that is no longer alive from the earlier 20th century. Uh, and I'll speak in a minute about the work of Cermelo on chess. But a player in chess, in the game of chess, is not one of these players. Yes. 
A player is the position. You are white, and you look what white in chess could do, the strategies of white. It is true that in game theory there is room to incorporate also the analysis of games in which you incorporate the same game of chess. You look of it as a family of several games with different abilities of the players, and the question is how to formalize what are different abilities of the players and to classify it as a family of games. Another game that I like <laughs> is soccer. And one of the Hungarian famous players in soccer, probably the greatest of all times, is uh, Pushkash. Yes. And again, the game of soccer is also a game, but it's more difficult in a sense to formalize it without taking into account abilities of the players. And as we will formalize other games that we think of it as, as sequence of games, so a sequence of uh, stages by which there is one first move, second move, and so on, it's a kind of a game in continuous time, because all the time there are outcomes of actions of the players. So there will be a small reference to continuous time games later, but again, uh, soccer will not be covered by what I'm speaking today. So the first kind of mathematical theorem of in game theory was Sir Mello, that he delivered the talk in the one, 1912 Congress of Mathematics. And he proved that in the game of chess, either white can force a win, so either white has some strategy, you could write instructions for white that will force that he wins the game, or black can force a win, or each one could force a draw. By the way, it's an interesting question nobody knows nowadays, even though there is a feeling that the black can force a win is not possible because from experience, people are used to the fact that white has a slight advantage. But nobody could, fall. so far, nobody can prove it, this theorem, that this possibility that black and false win is not true. OK, so I will essentially almost prove you this theorem of Zermelo. And uh, I will state a more general theorem, which is a win-loss game of perfect information. So we look on a game, on a result on games that generalizes that Zermelo's theorem follows from it. And we look on sequential games. First stage, player one chooses a move A1. And thereafter, player two chooses a move B1. In the Kate stage of the game, player one chooses AK, and player two chooses BK. So now we know what the game is progressing. So a play of the game will be a sequence of moves, A1, B1, up to A and B N, if it's an end stage game. And then we define when player one wins. So we, I said a, a sequential game with perfect information. In a moment, I'll explain the concept of perfect information. And then there are sequence of moves, plays of game, by which one wins. And otherwise, player two wins. The game is of perfect information if before each of his choices of a player, he observes all past moves. So he knows what happened so far. And now comes a concept which is important. The pure strategy of a player in such a game, since he knows everything in the past, is what he does in his skate move as a function of all past moves. And the theorem the determinacy of games of perfect information without chance moves. Here, there were no chance moves, like in chess, in poker, or in other games, there would be chance moves. That either player one has a pure strategy that guarantees that I, player one, wins, or player two has a strategy that guarantees the two wins. And for the mathematicians, you have a trivial proof of this theorem, because it follows from the fact that the logical negation of the formal quantifier statement that player one has a winning strategy is the formal quantifier statement that player two has a winning strategy. Because what is the formal 
statement that player one has a winning strategy, that there exists a first move, such that for any sec reply of player two, there exists a second move of player one, such that for every, and so on, such that the sequence is a win for player one. Isn't that set W? What is the negation of this statement, logically? If there doesn't exist a first move for player one, it means that for every move of player one, there exists a move of player two such that this is not in W. So if you look on it from the logical statement, and for the mathematicians, it's uh, people are sta making these statements automatically in all their logical arguments, but they never prove it. So you have to prove it by induction. Yes. Okay. Now let me give an example of matching pennies, a simultaneous move gain, because we say that eventually it translates everything to a simultaneous move gain. So let's look on one simultaneous move gain, which is described by this matrix. Player one, his strategy are either top or bottom. Player two strategies are either left or right. And the entry in the matrix specifies what is the payoff to player one. Namely, if he wins or loses. So this is not a game of perfect information because you don't observe first the move of the other player before you take your move. It's simultaneous moves. And you could see that in this game, if player one takes the first move, all that he can guarantee is a payoff of zero. And if player two is the first one to take the move, all he guarantees player one could force a win. So in symbols, for the mathematicians, I write it here. Yes. The max mean, maximizing over the strategy of player one, minimizing over the strategy of player two, the pure strategy, this gives zero. Player one cannot force a win. But if uh, you minimize by a strategy of player two, and then look on the reply of player one, the mean max is one. So if player two would have moved first, that Let's look on an end stage simultaneous move games. Before it was one move. So the first player one chooses A1 and B1 simultaneously. And thereafter, there is a chance move. Chance makes a move C1. The K stage, player one takes an action AK and BK and play to BK simultaneously, and then nature chooses CK. So the play of the game, first of all, the distribution of CK of nature, when I say nature, means that its distribution is determined by everything that followed so far in the game. It's not a choice of nature. It's dictated by the rules. A play of the game is a sequence of moves of, of players and nature. And again, player one wins if that sequence is in some specific winning strategy. So W is a subset of the place. A place includes here also the moves of nature. And the game is finite if the number of moves at each stage is finite. And for Neumann's result 1928 is that any finite simultaneous move game has a value V, namely player one as a mixed strategy. So not a pure strategy as before that he specifies all the rules. He disguises what he takes as his first move, it takes a probability distribution, which is called the mixed strategy, that guarantees that he wins with probability at least V, and player two as a mixed strategy that guarantees that player one will win with probability at most V, and therefore V is called the minimax value of the game. So this can be generalized to matrix game. So player one, the pure strategies are set A, the pure strategies of player two are B, and then we have a real valued function as a result of the choice of the two uh, pure actions, A and B. And, and the players, we think of it as playing simultaneously. And one could say that any such game, I wrote a general payoff, but it is equivalent to a win-loss game with a chance move, because if the payoff is one half, you could interpret it as nature decides if the payoff is one with probability one half or zero with probability one half. And the minimax theorem of Neumann states that any finite matrix game has a value V, and each player has an optimal strategy. Namely, there exists a number V called the minimax value of the game. Player one has a mixed strategy 
called an optimal strategy, that guarantees that the expectation of its payoff is at least V, no matter what is the strategy of player two. And player two has a mixed strategy called optimal strategy of player two that guarantees that the expectation of the payoff of player one is at most V, no matter what is the strategy that player one takes. Now let's move to the second part, which is stochastic games. And in my description of the simultaneous move games with chance moves were a kind of a preparation for this type of model. So this was a paper by Shapley, 53, communicated by von Neumann. So what is a two-person zero-sum stochastic game? It's a multi-stage game. The environment or position or state, the formal language is state, changes from one stage to the next stage. If you think of fighting of ut utilizing natural resources, if you use some of the resources, you affect the situation of next time. If you look on models of global warming, then, and you try to optimize maybe the average of the GNP of the world, you know that if you make too much optimization, you may damage the future time. And therefore, there is a situation that changes from time to time. In each stage, the players face a matrix game. So I'm going back now to the two-person zero-sum, so it's easy to illustrate. So in each state, you think of a matrix game. But the current, the current state and the actions of the players at this stage specify the payoff that the player gets. The stochastic game payoff is a weighted in the entire game. We say you get stages is a kind of a weighted average of the stage payoffs or a limit of such weighted, like I said before, the long run average of this payoff. Therefore, in a stochastic game, in all the applications, and also in the mathematical theory of it, the choice of action at each stage is guided by two often conflicting objectives. On the one end, you want to maximize the payoff that you get today in this period. But on the other end, you want to guarantee that you are moving to, a next, to the next state that is favorable for you. A pair of strategies like before of player one and player two define a probability distribution over place of, and therefore also over the streams of payoffs. And the objective of each player depends on his valuation of the streams of payoffs. Player one desires to maximize his valuation of the stream of payoffs. And player two, who is the adversary of player one, tries to minimize it. So the Minimax theorem for discounted stochastic games. So in the first paper of Shapley, slightly more general, but at least if you look on the game, it generates a sequence of payoff G1 in period one, G2 in period two, and so on. And you evaluate the stream as often as classical by economic theories to take the discount, the present value of it, to weigh the different payoffs GT or period T by this weight. The sum of the weights is one. You always take sum of the weights of one so that a constant payoff is valued as this constant payoff. And Shapley's 53 payer, paper shows that any two zero sum are discounted stochastic game with finitely many states and actions as a value which we'll call VR for later notation. And each player has stationary optimal strategies. The fact stationary strategy means that you don't have to look on everything that happened so far in the game. You just have to look on the present situation. And the reason is that if you look on this payoff function, if you know what happened in the first stages, five stages of the game, from here onward, you are trying to optimize, again, a multiple of such, uh, of such things. So you can forget the history. I would already right now say that in the long run average, this property of stationary or disregarding the history is impossible. So let me quickly describe to you one such stochastic game. Called the MIG match was introduced by Gillette in 57 and solved by Blackwell and Ferguson in the late 60s. 
So I say there are states, and in each state there is a matrix game. So the two bottom one are trivial matrix games, a payoff of zero, a payoff of one. You could interpret it winning or losing in this period. And the top payoff is, the top matrix is like the matching pennies. But now I have to decide what happens to the transitions. What is the next state? So if we are in each one of those bottom two states, yes, we are basically staying there. There is no move out. These are kind of absorbing states. But if we are on the top matrix, if we play that box, then we move to this state. If we play that box, we move to this space. And if we play the bottom, the top row, we stay, we play again this game. How to optimize this if you wo worry about the long-term averages of the game? Not a trivial issue. It's been took a couple of years since the statement of this problem for its solution. In the undiscounted player, one maximizes the frequency of winning rounds, the rounds by which the payoff is won. I'll show you another game very quickly which is the Bewley and Kolberg game, 1976, which is slightly twist on it. So you see that in this game, you have four different matrix games, four different positions. In each one, the payoff is specified. So in this game, all the fight will be for the next position, not for the payoff, because you know that in each of these states, you'll get the payoff. In the bottom one, you come back from these boxes you are going here from the, those boxes, you are staying in the same game from, if you play this box or this box, you stay in the same matrix game. And in all other cases, you are switching stages. Again, when they posed it, it was unclear how to play this game. What is the value of this game if you are playing it for infinitely many rounds and you try to maximize the expected rounds that you are winning the game. So strategies in the stochastic games are exactly like strategies in the simultaneous move games with chance moves, because what we have here is simultaneous moves and chance moves. So you have the concept of a play of the game, which is the initial state, the actions of the two players, the next state that nature chooses according to some fixed probability. So this is a play. And a strategy specifies of the player specifies the action as a function of everything that in the past. So we are looking here on case that you remember all the past. So you get a sequence of stage payoffs. The first, the solution for the general finite stochastic game, is two person zero sum, was in a paper of Mertens and myself that we proved that any two person zero sum discount, undiscounted, so we look on the long run average stochastic game with finitely many states and action as a value v. Namely, and let me elaborate, what does it mean? There is a number v, like in the minimax theorem. And for every epsilon, each player has epsilon optimal strategies. There is no chance here to get optimal strategies. Only you could maximize within an epsilon. And this means that if you take the limit superior, the long run average, if you want to take the limit inferior, for mathematicians, you have to be specific. So look on the limb superior. Player one has a strategy that guarantees that the expectation of this long run average is at least V minus epsilon, no matter what is the strategy of player two. And similarly, player two has a strategy, a mixed strategy, that guarantees that the expectation of this payoff is no more than V plus epsilon, no matter what the strategy of player one is. And I already indicated before, but let me repeat, it's an important story here. Obviously, if you played 10 periods of the game, all that matters is the future payoffs because you look on the long run average. So it looks that if you should have been able to play optimally or approximate optimally without looking back, this is not the case. It's impossible. You must look on the back, and if you remember from the Bible, the Paros strategy is if you have seven years, you will have seven years with good uh, productivity, be careful, save some for the next years that will be with low probability. So you have to look your actions 
is not stationary, is not just time dependent. You look what happened in the past. And indeed, the solution of this theorem was uh, a kind of a similarity to what the Federal Reserve in the US is doing. It's basically looking, adjusting interest rates according, according to the performance of the economy. So when they see that people are, are, are investing too much now, and you think it's too much investment, take care of now, they increase the interest rate. Say, careful, you, today is more important than tomorrow. And basically, the solution of that is a very careful play with interest rates, with a discount factor, that you compute that discount factor as a function of what happened in the past, so like the Faro strategies, and you play optimally as if you are in our discounted game. So let's move now to How much time are you? Eight. Eight? It's 45. I started with eight minutes, OK. Uh, so quickly, I want to come to the open problem. So Nash, 1928 to 15, is uh, the only person who has been awarded both the Nobel Prize in economics and the Abel Prize in mathematics. And obviously, if for Neumann would have lived slightly longer, he will be in the same category. Yes. And as mentioned before, also winning all the Nobel Prizes in a few other areas. So Nash equilibrium theorem, multi-player, so the same as two players competi competition. You look on each player as his own payoff function, so not as before as one maximizes, the other one minimizes. And the Nash equilibrium is a list of strategies that no player can benefit from unilateral deviation. And the theorem of Nash says that a game with finitely many players and pure strategy has a Nash equilibrium. Namely, there is a list of mixed strategies, x star i for each player, such that if only player i decides to switch it doesn't gain anything. So no unilateral deviation generates thing. Multiplayer non-zero sum games is the trivial generalization of the previous uh, two-person competitive game. The state changes from stage to stage. In each state, the players face a multiplayer non-zero sum game. The current state and action profile of the players determine the payoff in this stage and the probability distribution to the next stage. A list of strategies of the players define a probability distribution over place of the stream and over streams of payoffs. And each player desires to maximize his own valuation of the stream of his payoffs. So a play defines a stream of stage payoff. OK, let's we could run on that. And let's define what is the undiscounted equilibrium in finite non-zero sum stochastic game. So the number of players is finite, the number of states is finite, the number of actions of each player is finite. An undiscounted epsilon equilibrium is a strategy profile such that no player can benefit by more than epsilon from a unilateral deviation. Namely, the expectation with respect to this strategy, this strategy sigma epsilon defines the distribution the expectation of the limit superior of the averages of his payoff is at least what he will get by some unilateral deviation to a strategy sigma i up to an epsilon for any deviation. An open problem, the one that I promised the dinner plus transportation is, is it true that any finite stochastic gain as for every epsilon an undiscounted equilibrium and there are special cases, much work has been done on this uh, wall, and special cases are known to that this is true. It's stochastic games with perfect information, which are stochastic games, finite stochastic games, where they, for each state only one player moves. There are irreducible games, which means if you play what's a family of what's called stationary strategies, then the Markov chain on the state is irreducible. 
It is true for two players to cast the games, a deep result, uh, over 100 pages of proofs by VA. It's true for three player, a subclass of stochastic game called absorbing games, and several classes of quitting games. And now a comment relating a little to soccer. A stochastic game is a discrete time multi-stage game. So we have stages one and one. The analogous continuous time version of a stochastic game as an undiscounted equilibrium. A priori, it looks a more complicated model, but some new features evolve in the continuous time that you could prove this theorem. And this is uh, a result of mine, that any continuous time finite stochastic game as for every epsilon and undiscounted epsilon equilibrium. And another class of games for which we know that this that this is the case is finite stochastic game with observable mixed action. When you are coming to a, a stage, you you could choose a, you could choose to play top or bottom, let's say, with probability half and half. But the question is, the other player doesn't know that you chose it with probability half and half. He only observes what you actually ch chose. So in a stochastic game, you'll try to infer from the other of what are the probabilities. But if you are sending these instructions to a referee who discloses it to the other player, these are stochastic game with observable mixed actions. And a forthcoming result is that any finite stochastic game with observable mixed action as for every epsilon and undiscounted epsilon equilibrium. And the results holds also for classical stochastic game, but now with finitely many states, convex, that, that's for the mathematicians that are familiar with this concept, convex semi-algebraic action sets and multilinear payoff and transition functions. And I would just finish here with the last slide. The presentation will be on my site, so you can uh, view the details, what is each one of these meanings. These are the three topics that I said, I'm not sure that I'll get to it in the lecture. So there is the asymptotic theory, the uniform theory, and the robust theory, where we look on different uh, concepts. Thank you. When we started to organize this, this conference, everyone is saying that we should a presentation on the, on the game theory. This is a very uh, in, in, impressive from, from Neumann. And we are happy to, uh, you, you, uh, you accepted our, our invitation and, and uh, give an outline of, the, of game theory. And we see some results from, from you as well. Thank you very much for the presentation. Is a, is a, Medal from the, this, this, uh, this uh, memorial year. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And we have a, a new uh, area. We are moving to the new area. The next uh, uh, next uh, 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 presenter is is uh, uh, Professor Domokos Saz. He is a Seychelles Prize winner, uh, Hungarian mathematician and uh, professor of the, of the Budapest University of Technology and, and Economy, and he is a member of the, of the Akade Hungary Academy as well. And the pro, uh, topic is, is a, the Neumann uh, result of the er, er, ergodic uh, theorem, please. Well. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to talk here. Of course, it's very hard to talk after two excellent talks. So, uh, well, before starting, so this is the content of my talk, and there is a zeros point in that, which is actually before the actual mathematical content of my lecture. It's about the breadth of Neumann's reputation. Uh, recently, in this spring, I was drinking beer with a Russian-American mathematician friend of mine. 
and he said that the greatest mathematician of the 20th century was definitely Neumann. I was modest. I told him, well, there were several excellent mathematicians in the 20th century. But he said, look, look at Wikipedia. So I looked at Wikipedia. And there is this part in Wikipedia someone is known for. And yellow means the subjects which Neumann is known for. So you can see the start of the list. And there is the continuation of the list. And at the end of this continuation, there is plus 93. <laughs> Almost infinite. So OK. I just looked up Einstein. Now there is Einstein in Wikipedia. So this blue, the achievements of Einstein, known for. So on this page and on the next page, not comparable. Of course, there is no sense to compare these giants of science. But that's an interesting remark. OK, go to the uh, actual content of my talk. Uh, probably I will repeat some points, but that doesn't make any problem. So Nainan was born in uh, 1903. So uh, the father convinced him to study chemistry. So he studied chemistry in Berlin and ETH. During these studies, he made a PhD with Lipot Feyer, Hungarian excellent mathematician about the axiomatization of set theory we have heard about it today. Now, in 26, there was a big change in Neumann's life and his scientific interest. So from early autumn in 26, he went to Göttingen. And Göttingen was the center, a boiling center of science, of physics and mathematics. So you see who were there. So there was the birth of uh, quantum theory. There were Heisenberg born. So you see the names. Actually, in italics, you see the names who later received the Nobel Prizes. Seven people received the Nobel Prizes. And probably Oppenheimer and Teller didn't receive the Nobel Prize because of political reasons. But that's not my topic to talk about it. So, so there was. Uh, quantum physics in birth. Moreover, and I think this is why uh, actually Neumann went to Göttingen, because Hilbert was there. And Hilbert had an interest in uh, set theory, in logic. And Hilbert appreciated the influence set theory logic. And Hilbert was also interested in quantum theory. And in general, the neighborhood that year in, in Göttingen was 23. He was 23. So at this age, he could absorb a lot of new ideas. And he did absorb a lot of new ideas. And he was very much influenced. That he, it's fantastic what he did. So you will see, actually, in the earlier talks, you, you could have already seen what he did. But uh, I, I will now go to one problem which Hilbert was interested in. So mathematicians certainly know, but non-mathematicians uh, might be interested to learn that. So Hilbert was a sort of leading personality in mathematics at, the, at this time. So in 1900, uh, uh, there was an International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris. And Hilbert was a prestigious, most prestigious mathematician. He was asked to talk about some problems for the 20th century. So he collected 23 problems for the 20th century. And among these problems, there was one problem, the sixth problem, which uh, the title is Mathematical Treatment of the axioms of physics. And these are, this is the text from the beginning of Hilbert's formulation. The investigations on the foundations of geometry, such as the problem, 
to treat in the same manner by means of axioms those physical sciences in which mathematics play an important part. In the first rank are the theory of probabilities and mechanics. As to the theory of probability, well, just one remark. So, foundations of geometry. We learned at school about uh, Euclidean axioms from geometry. So that was the, the goal of mathematical theories to repeat uh, mathematical theories like geometry in Euclid's form. So, uh, return to uh, Hilbert's text. As to the axiom of the theory of probabilities, it seems to me desirable that their logical investigation should be accompanied by a rigorous and satisfactory development of the method of mean values in mathematical physics, and in particular, in the kinetic theory of gases. So what happened before? What turned Hilbert's interest to this question? Actually, I call your attention that this formulation of the sixth problem is rather vague. And it's not surprising, because mathematics at this time was not sufficiently developed to give a more, mathematics of these subjects was not sufficiently developed to give a more precise formulation. But Hilbert definitely stressed the importance to understand this. So there were some results earlier. For instance, uh, there were very nice, very beautiful results in a sort of naive probability theory Fermat, Pascal, Bernoulli, Laplace, you see these names earlier, much earlier. I just remarked that the axiomatizations of probability theory only happened in 1933 by Kolmogorov. And the other topic is the birth of naive statistical physics. So in the 19th century, Gibbs, Maxwell, and Boltzmann they were trying to give some more uh, strict formulation of the theory of the kinetic theory of gases, for instance. In fact, Boltzmann uh, had several papers about this, and uh, he formulated an ergodic hypothesis, which was in terms of physics, so it was not well formed. It was roughly formed, but it certainly was important and he formulated the ergodic hypothesis. OK. Now, uh, I will try to give some idea what uh, had Boltzmann in mind. And I will try to give the simplest example for that. So understand notions like temperature, pressure, pressure of a gas, we completely understand I mean, we think we completely understand what it is. So, but these guys, they wanted to give a better understanding. So, and processes like diffusion, heat transfer, and so on. So, let me focus on pressure. Well, there is, in, in this picture, you see, this is a two-dimensional picture, and you can imagine it's a particles of a gas. Each particle has some they have equal masses, and each has a velocity. And you understand what pressure is. You understand that pressure is the following, that on the boundary of the square, how you measure. So you take some average in time in a unit surface, and unit time you take the average, and this is what we think it's a pressure. It's a very simple thing, but to give a precise mathematical explanation or physical explanation for that, it's not so easy, and this will, uh, this I will talk about. This is actually Boltzmann ergodic hypothesis that this pressure really exists, and what the goal is to derive uh, the ergodic hypothesis, which I will tell you later what it is, from the atomic theory of matter from Newton laws, from a deterministic dynamics. OK. So I will start with two very simple, the simplest mathematical examples 
before I go to more complicated models. So there is a, a, the head or tail. We heard about games, the so head or tail, it's also a game. This is a sort of mathematical model of this game of head or tails. So uh, this you should understand in the following way. On the left-hand side, you see a picture. It's a map of the interval. It's a map of the interval, and the formula for this map of the interval is on the upper right-hand side. It's called Tx. This is a map. And this is 2x if uh, you are in the left in the interval i0, and 2x minus 1 if in the right interval. Actually, mathematicians would say that it's 2x modulo 1. So this is the map of the interval. And if you take the second iterate of this map of the interval, then uh, you get, you, you can see on the right-hand picture uh, how you get the iterates of, the, of a point x0. So you, you, you will get tx0, which is x1, x2, tx1, uh, and so on, and so on. Now, uh, a very simple fact that the length is invar invariant under t. What it means? That it means that if you take a small subinterval and you take the preimages, then it has two preimages and uh, of of half size, and the sum of the two halves is the same as one. So it's uh, this, this length is invariant. And uh, one can introduce a sort of symbolic dynamics, which is following the trajectory of this point. And for every n, uh, uh, giving note whether it belongs to the left interval or the right interval. And this is epsilon 0 and so on, epsilon, epsilon n. Now, it's very easy to see that this epsilon 0, epsilon, epsilon n is a sequence of independent coin tosses, heads or tails. And we know that by the law of large numbers, if to add up all the epsilons until n minus 1 and divide by the number n, this converges to 1 half, of course. So if you take heads or tails for a long time, then approximately half of the tosses will be. And this is the law of large numbers. This is a very uh, simple example. Now I will show you my last uh, example, which is also a simple, a bit more complicated than the previous one. This is, oh, this, uh, okay, Arnold cat map. Uh, well, this is a map of the square so uh, on the left-hand side, you have a picture of 2 times 3 squares. So I'm talking about the left lower square on the, on the left-hand side. And you take an image by this matrix. It's easy to see that the image of this square will be this elongated parallelogram. And uh, you can do the following. You shift each pieces in the other squares back to the original square. So it's easy to see that if you take the blue triangle, you can shift it back to the original square, and you get a blue triangle. The same for the yellow one, the same for the green one. All together, you get the same square as you started with. This is, map is called Arnold's cat because Arnold, a Soviet Russian mathematician, he wanted to illustrate this in a more interesting way. So he put a cat in this square. He considered the image of the cat first in the parallelogram. You see this elongated picture. 
and then shifting back the pieces to the original square, you get this uh, rightest hand figure. And this is the image of the cat under one iteration of the map. And again, as I told you, the, the area is invariant, invariant under T. So I showed you these two examples because they are the simplest examples of a theorem of ergodic theorem of, uh, of Neumann. Now, what Edler and Weiss also in 97, 67 they found that they could decompose this original square into three, uh, on the picture they are rectangles, the green one, the red one, and the yellow one. Well, when I am talking about rectangles, there is one thing which I want to explain at this point, that these are, of course, rectangles, not as you see them, but if you do the following, you imagine the square in the following way. You glue the opposing sides of the square to each other. Then, of course, you have a square. You have a square. You first turn and glue opposite sides together. You get something like that. And then the whole thing you can turn over again and you get a swimming ring, right? And this is, mathematicals call it shorter torus. It's a two-dimensional torus. And this is the two, so instead of the square, you should imagine the geometry of this swimming ring. And on the swimming ring, these are uh, rectangles, okay? And you can, again, do the same that you make the iterates of, the, of this map, of the Arnold cat map, and at every step you make mark to which part of this decomposition uh, the image belongs, and you get, again, a so-called symbolic dynamics, epsilon zero, epsilon, epsilon n. Now, this is not independent random variables as it was the case in the, in the head or tail. But this is a so-called stationary Markov chain. Markov chain is not independent things, but uh, random variables, random objects with no memory. So the present only depends on the previous step, but not the earlier, not the earlier uh, history. OK, and then for uh, this mark of change, there is also a, a law of large numbers. And again, the average converges to some value, which is the mean value, the expected value of this thing. OK. Now, I go to Neumann's problem. And so what I told you, that uh, Birkhoff made a formulation, uh, sorry, Boltzmann made a formulation which had no sense, no mathematical, some intuitive physical sense, definitely it had. It was an ingenious, actually ingenious hypothesis, but no mathematical sense behind it. Now, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, ergodic theory dealing with these kinds of problems, developed, and very clever people were trying to understand the notion of ergodicity, George Berkhoff, Bernd Kuppen, and Andre Weil. On the other hand, also in the early 20th century, something different happened, which we have heard already about it. So Hilbert Schmidt and Frederick Ries introduced infinite dimensional spaces. So the space which we think of is the Euclidean space, two-dimensional plane or three-dimensional our space. And one can think of 100-dimensional Euclidean spaces, but as these mathematicians uh, introduced, there's also possible to 
think in terms of infinite dimensional spaces, which are much similar and much different from finite dimensional Euclidean spaces. But these are the Hilbert spaces. And it turned out that Hilbert spaces <coughs> meant just the perfect mathematical language for quantum physics. And this was what Neumann also understood it. We heard that he had a joint paper also with Hilbert about this. And in fact, in these years, 30, 31, 32, perhaps or is it 91, 29 starting, he wrote a great book about mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics. So he knew about Hilbert spaces. He understand and he applied them. Okay, so what happened then? Then he could formulate his ergodic theorem in 32, and I will give the formulation for the simplest case. So you take again a map of the interval, which preserves the, the length, the, we call it Lebesgue measure, mathematicians we call it, and this theorem says the following. Well, there is a Hilbert space behind all these things. Uh, I think not only mathematicians, but of course physicists, engineers are familiar with Hilbert spaces because you work with spectrum, spectral decomposition. So this is behind all these, there are Hilbert spaces. So you take the space of so-called square integrable functions and <coughs> The theorem says that this average, so-called time average, of this function exists, and it's this f bar limit, which depends on the point in principle. And also, Neumann could add that this limit function is the projection of the original function to the space of t invariant. Functions. So those functions which are, do not change under this map T. For instance, the constant function, if you apply a map to a point, the function is constant. So the constant function is, of course, invariant. This is just one uh, direction in this space. This is a projection, not in a Euclidean space, but it's a, an infinite dimensional space. So he could characterize the the, the limit. And then there is a mathematical defi definition that the, uh, this map, this transformation is called the ergodic if this limit set, limit, is constant, consists of the invariant functions con con then contain only the constant functions. It's, it's constant functions, constant times a constant, it's also a constant, so this is a one-dimensional line, actually. So this is the only invariant function, this one. So this is the definition of, ergo, of ergodicity. And very briefly, uh, when I start with it, can you tell me? Hmm? Thank you very much. I will try to control myself. So now I will give you a one-page proof of Neumann theorem. So this uh, wants to illustrate what I said in the title, a small step for a, a genius, because it's really now we understand it's a simple fact. It's a simple proof. I can give it in roughly one page. So if you have a constant function, if you apply this time average of the constant function, in the limit you get a constant, so no question. Now if you take functions which are of this form, some function g minus its map, tg, then it's very easy to see that if you take this sum then g minus t, g, t, g minus t squared, and so on. It, this sum contains only two terms. 
And if you divide by n, which tends to infinity, then the limit is 0. Now, these two kind of functions, the, the constant function and functions which are of this form, g minus tg, easy mathematics gives that these functions are dense in our favorite Hilbert space, so the theorem is true for every function. So it's, it's simple, right? Now, of course, I leave out some mathematical details, but at this point I want to make a remark that Neumann's ergodic theorem, uh, so this limit can be understood in different ways, and mathematicians are eager to understand all the possible ways of the limits. So Neumann's ergodic theorem was formulated in this Hilbert space, so the claim of the theorem should be understood in this spa space of square integrable functions. And uh, Neumann's theorem doesn't say that the same limit exists for almost every initial point. Not for every, but for almost every. And this is an additional state, a different statement. And actually what happened in the history that Neumann already understood his theorem. And Neumann was a sort of, his life was mathematics in a leisurely way. So he, he lived in mathematics, he wanted to discuss mathematics with everyone, and so he also discussed mathematics with George Birkhoff, telling him his proof of the so-called mean ergodic theorem. This is the Neumann ergodic theorem. And of course, the problem arose whether this kind of almost, for almost every point, is it true? This appeared. And Neumann was doing a lot of things parallelly, so he was of certainly writing his book, he was working on game theory, and so on, and so on, logic. So he didn't focus so much on trying to prove this. And Berkhoff proved, and there is a history which is uh, written actually in several places, that Berkhoff was the editor of the journal where Neumann wanted to publish his paper, and somehow Berkov arranged that his paper first appeared, though Neumann's results was the first. But later, this problem was arranged gentleman-like, so from the side of Berkov too, so now we know what the history of, and of course, both are great mathematicians. Okay. Now, so uh, the question arises, what about, so I, I told you that there is this uh, Neumann's ergodic theorem, and, and we say that the, this map is ergodic if the limit function is constant. So now I would ask, the first video, this one. So these are five disks in two dimensional. It's a, it, you should understand it, it's a gas. And there are five particles which collide according to Newton's uh, mechanics. And this is on the torus. So here you see what we mathematicians called torus, so if there is a disk going out on one side, it returns on the other side, and the colors mean the energy of the particle. And so Boltzmann's original conjecture somehow was about the following. If you take a gas of particles, then you can measure uh, pressure on the boundary, well, the, the torus has no boundary. I will later go to the case when there is a boundary. But even in this case, you can uh, check the energy which comes to a surface of unit measure on this square 
from one side, and this would be the pressure. So the question is whether this system is ergodic. And, uh, okay, thank you. And Sinai, in 93, formulated the following hypothesis, that if you take any number of hard walls on any dimensional, or two-dimensional, three-dimensional, whatever, that this system is robotic. So pressure exists. It does not happen. The following thing, of course, we know it does not happen. But mathematically, we have to prove. It could also be that there is a limit. And with half probability, the limit is 2. With half probability, it's 1 half. And this could be, but it is not so. And this is uh, what Sinai's hypothesis was for this model. So n is ergodic. Actually, Sinai in 63 saw that he can prove it. But when he worked out the proof, it turned out that he, it was a great result that he could prove that two disks on the two-dimensional torso system of two elastic disks colliding, this is ergodic. And later in 87, they could extend the results for arbitrary dimensions with only two balls. And the method which Sinai worked out for this, uh, for proving the ergodicity, he started the theory of so-called hyper hyperbolic dynamical system with singularities. And this method became substantial in the theory of chaos. You know uh, the butterfly effect. So behind the butterfly effect, there is this kind of hyperbolic behavior. And I repeat here Arnold's cat, which shows that what is important that you have this expansion, poor cat. So there is expansion in one side. And because of singularities, it's cut it to pieces. So this is the simplest example of a hyperbolic dynamical system with singularities. Of course, there are much more interesting examples. For, in for example, you can have heard about the Lorentz attractor. There is also the same phenomenon that there is hyperbolicity, expansion and contraction in the other side. So this is what hyperbolicity is about. I don't uh, have time to talk more about it. Now, Sinai. Uh, studied for his result in 1970. He introduced the Sinai billiard. It turns out that arbitrary number of balls, it's, it's this kind of billiard. So the, the dark circles, these are on the torus, dark circles, these are fixed so-called scatterers. And the particle, it's a point particle which moves hits the scatterer, and according to elastic reflection, it, it gets collided. So this is the Sinai billiard. And the important observation that arbitrary number of balls on the torus is isomorphic to a Sinai billiard. Now, on, here you saw, I mentioned the results of Sinai and Chernoff Sinai. The two disks or two balls in arbitrary dimensional torus, it's an ergodic system. Now, I told about this uh, isomorphy to a Sinai billiard, but the scatterers in the case of two balls are strictly convex, like on the left hand side. So if you have this wave front, after one collision, it gets strictly convex after one collision. And if you have three or more balls, then it does not get strictly convex, but only uh, scattering in one direction. In the other direction, it's not. So that's an additional problem. And uh, so Sinai and his school, they could not solve it. And this is what we could treat first. 
three and four balls. And then with uh, Nandor Shimani, we could prove that almost uh, the uh, hypothesis of Sinai that n balls on the d-dimensional toes ergodic, typically only. So for almost, uh, we were applying uh, algebraic ge geometric method. We understood that it's not important, but Nandor Shimani, for Nandor Shimani, took 14 years to get the complete answer to the uh, OK, now what about general interactions? Not only these hardball collisions of hard balls, which I mentioned. And I think perhaps my time does not permit to go much further, so I, will, I want to finish on this at least. So Kolmogorov, Arnold, and Moser, actually Kolmogorov found the idea and he gave a sort of the idea of the proof, but he didn't work out the complete proof in uh, 54, that if you take other interaction than this hardcore collision of hard balls, of billiard balls, then the system is not ergodic. There are unpleasant initial configurations when you, you don't get this ergodicity, you don't get the pressure correctly. So after uh, this negative result, uh, now the expectation is that if you have a different interaction, then you have one large ergodic component, which is getting larger and larger as the number of the particles tends to infinity. Now, returning to Birkhoff. Birkhoff uh, wanted to give the proof of ergodicity, and he worked a lot on it in general. We see that the system is not ergodic. So, in a sense, he worked in vain. And this is what, uh, so there is a book by Hirsch about Peter Lex. Uh, and computers also serve as laboratories, laboratories for mathematicians. New mathematical relations can be discovered, and our hypothesis and assumptions can be disproved or found more likely by computations. So this shows how Neumann's interests were coupled, computers and mathematics. Lux mentioned George David Birkhoff's lifetime effort to prove the ergodic hypothesis before computers were available. If Birkhoff had been able to test the hypothesis on a computer, he would have found examples that this is not true. By the way, uh, this morning when I was coming here, I was trying to look up I, I know Peter, Peter Lex is a Hungarian-born Abel Prize winner mathematician. He left Hungary at the age of 15 and he, in 41, and he was very gifted. He also got to Los Alamos, where he met Neumann too. And uh, there was an interview with Lux 10 years ago. And uh, the question was that it's certainly true that for being such a tremendously influential figure in 20th century mathematics, von Neumann isn't remarkably well known today. Actually, I have met some Americans. One of them is a, a Oscar Prize winner, winner film director and also a regular contributor to National Geographic and other journals. And I asked him, and he, haven't he hasn't heard about Neumann. So this is the case. And also other American did it. Why do you believe this is? Why did von Neumann fall to make as large an impact in the public eye as, say, Albert Einstein or Alan Turing? And Peter Lex answered, it's a mystery to me why von Neumann isn't a household name among educated people. The most powerful brain 
father of the modern computer, uncle of the atomic bomb. This is the stuff of legends. And he was a legend in his lifetime among those who knew him. Perhaps an article in the New York Times on some anniversary could start the ball rolling. Well, uh, I think my time is over. Uh, I would have uh, talked much more about the influence of the ergodic theorem on science, so on the proof of atomic theory and also relation to Einstein, but uh, I thank you for attention. Definitely, I want to... Yes, uh, this picture is an, on the on the on the book of Bhattacharya, who is who is uh, uh, issued a, a book last year, at the end of the last year, and he visited here and visited the, the high school of, of Neumann, and we discussed him, and he said it very similar what what, what Domokos said that uh, he is a uh, he is a. Uh, 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 made interview with uh, many, 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 many people in the in the scientists in the, in the different area, chemical and other, and it is not well known on the on the on the on the Neumann, and there they decided to 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 write this this uh, book. Man of the, the, the title is "Man of the Future," "Man from the Future." I think it's very very uh, good book, and it was an intention that the Neumann intellectual uh, uh, life. They describe the Neumann in, intellectual life, not, not, not in the, the, the daily life, but really a, really a, a scientific life, because important to, to show that the scientists in the US and the UK and other countries, uh, the, the Neumann, Neumann works. And I think this, uh, this book is, is, is very good. Uh, we were able to, to make the Hungarian translation as well. You can find it in the, in, the, in, the, in the bookstore. But as I know, in this very, very, very popular in UK and, and already in the in the this has a has a, a show in the in the US as well and they, I hope that this help in this year to show the, the Neumann importance for the for the scientists who's not not able to 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 know who is in the, in, in earlier. Okay thank you very much and the next topic is a, a quantum informatics I think is a is an important question what is a relation to the the quantum informatics to the to the, the Neumann. Our presenter is uh, is uh, Sándor Imre, Professor Sándor Imre, who is member of the Hungarian uh, Academy, and he is head of the Department of Network System and Service at the Budapest University of Technology, and uh, is a is a researcher, senior researcher of the of the Hungarian National Laboratory of the Quantum Informatics. Please. at the entrance of uh, 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 the corridor. I uh, opened it randomly, and the following quote uh, confronted me. In the long run, the byproducts of nuclear science, means quantum mechanics, may be more important to the physical sciences than the direct result of initiating new sources of energy. So practically, these byproducts uh, for example, it will be my talk uh, this uh, uh, morning about quantum computing and communications, which is really founded and rooted uh, in the works of, of John von Neumann. Okay. So, uh, probably you remember that uh, this last weekend was very hot in Hungary, around 31, 32 centigrades, and Saturday afternoon as well as I was sit uh, sitting under the big walnut tree in our garden. This tree was planted by the grandma of my wife. And when I was thinking uh, about my today talk, a uh, Hungarian uh, folk song came into my mind from Transylvania. For the English-speaking audience, I translated. This is a raw translation. And uh, it uh, sounds like this. 
sorry, I won't sing it. I only read aloud because my <coughs> voice is not so uh, skilled. So this walnut tree was planted here by my grandfather. He did not sit in its shade. He did not eat its fruit. He didn't not didn't uh, do it for his own benefit, but for someone else. Therefore, his grandchildren bless his memory. So, of course, we can be regarded as uh, engineers dealing with quantum computing and communications as the byproducts of, of John von Neumann, but I would rather say that we are the fruits uh, of his walnut tree, because Quantum mechanics, which is the basics of this quantum computing and communication topic, is founded and mathematically formalized by John von Neumann. Okay. The main topics of my today's talk will cover the basic rules of quantum mechanics, the nanoverb. Uh, I apologize uh, uh, mathematicians and physicists in this room because I will approach from the engineering uh, perspective. So um, uh, please forgive me if I'm not as precise as, as you mathematicians or, or physicists. So I will give you an interpretation of the postulates and I will highlight some consequences. And because we are engineers, we would like to apply what the mathematicians and uh, physicists already discovered. Therefore, I will give you an insight into the world of quantum computers and quantum communication devices, and of course, the uh, applications. Uh, as, in the, as in the introduction, it was highlighted that uh, I am uh, the research director of the Quantum Information National Laboratory of Hungary. This organization uh, organizes the efforts, the quantum technology efforts here in Hungary. And uh, I would like to illustrate the results in the field of quantum computing and communication by the results of the Hungarian teams as well. Okay. So when we are speaking about quantum mechanics, I uh, brought here two uh, quotes, uh, one from Einstein. You are probably familiar with this quote, God does not play dice with the universe. And there was another uh, interesting, at least for me, interesting quote from Max von Lau, who is also, or uh, who was also a Nobel laureate. He said when he heard about the final solution for the quantum mechanics, that if that turns out to be true, I will quit physics. <clears throat> and this is the reason uh, why quantum computing and communication had a bit delayed compared to nuclear technology, because this strangeness of, of uh, quantum mechanics. But uh, I'm convinced that the good approach to handle quantum mechanics is uh, in accordance with the, with the motto of, of, of NASA. So the aerodynamical, dynamically, a bumblebee body is not made to fly. The good thing is that the bee doesn't know it. So we need to apply the quantum mechanics, and we should be or must be convinced that it is a valid description of nature. And as engineers, we need to find how can we utilize quantum mechanics. Here is only a, a, a picture about the, the, the market actually related to the quantum computing and communications. This is a $30 billion uh, market in 2022, and it has a 20% increase compared to the uh, previous years. And uh, I would like to call your attention that uh, this is a, a, a foreign chart, but there is Hungary in the middle in the blue box. So we were mentioned Hungary as a player in this world. OK, but uh, if we would like to go closer to quantum mechanics, it is worth investigating the dimensions of the universe, the distances between the biggest uh, dimensions and the smallest one. And it is interesting where the human being is standing between the largest and the smallest. OK, uh, I will use, or you can use your nail of your thumb to measure the universe. So my question is that if you put your uh, thumb towards the sky on a starry night, how many stars are covered by your fingernail? 
any estimation or guesses? Million? 100 million? Billion. Oh, it, it, it is good. OK, I, I give the solution. OK. So you cover 15,000 galaxies. And each galaxy has, in average, 1 billion stars. So the number of stars and so somehow the size of the universe can be represented by this huge uh, number. On the other hand, if we go down to the level of the uh, elementary particles, which behave according to the quantum mechanics, this is around or below the nanometer uh, range, then uh, you can use your nail to uh, represent the, this, dim this uh, dimension, because your nails uh, grow one nanometer, of course, in average, during one second. And where is the, the human being standing, or are standing? Oh, there is uh, a number uh, at the top of the slide. So the number of stars we already discussed. So this uh, uh, huge number uh, meant or, or referred only to the stars under your uh, nail of your thumb. But the whole number of stars in the universe uh, is the same number as the grains of sand in the Sahara Desert. Or if you compare the number of atoms within you, is more or less a bit larger than, than the, uh, than the uh, stars in the universe. So Blaise Pascal formulated a, a, a very good answer to the question, where are we standing in the universe? For after all, what is man in nature? And nothing in relation to infinity, all in relation to nothing, a central point between nothing and all, and infinitely far from the understanding either. But <clears throat> we know, thanks to John von Neumann, that we are closer and closer to understanding the nature around us. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I'm, I am an electrical engineer, so I am dealing with technology and not pure mathematics or, or physics. So this is a typical life cycle of an invention. This invention is the steam en engine. Roughly 2,000 years ago, Herons constructed his ball, which is based on the steam uh, engine principle somehow. And after 2,000 years, we uh, prepared and developed efficient and more efficient uh, steam engines. On the uh, bottom left picture, there is a steam uh, cylinder of the Titanic. This is a huge uh, monstrum with great efficiency among the steam engines. But when uh, we decided to fly with engines, then uh, it, it, uh, uh, we realized that, uh, that the steam engine, the efficiency of the steam engine is not enough to rise the plane to the air. Therefore, we need to stop think, and find something new, something new principles which uh, uh, make possible to the engine-based uh, flight. This is the explosive engine. This is the case in, in computer science or, 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 or computers. So you are, most of you, uh, I'm sure you are familiar with the uh, Moore's law, which uh, states that the number of transistors, the basic building blocks on a microchip doubles about every two years. Similarly, the cost of the computer is halved. But the principle behind this, this observation is that, that we design and implement smaller and smaller transistors. Therefore, we can use more and more transistors. Therefore, can, we can be faster and faster. But there is another consequence of uh, the Moore's law. Namely, if we count the electrons per device, the electrons per transistors, when we uh, design smaller and smaller transistors, we will reach the region when only one electron will be contained by the transistor. And in this case, one thing is sure, that the transistor works differently as we expected. 
And this is the range where, uh, uh, about I am speaking. This is the nanometer or, 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 or smaller uh, scale where the quantum mechanics described by many scientists, but among them uh, John von Neumann also played an important, important role. So this quantum mechanics describes the rules of, uh, of how the nature behaves at this scale. Practically, there is only four postulates. It depends on uh, the engineers uh, are saying four postulates. Physicists sometimes mention five. But uh, the, the, the important thing is that there are several very simple rules for the quantum mechanics. The question is, why do we learn Newtonian physics in the primary school instead of quantum mechanics? The reason is because these rules are quite strange and uh, seem to contradict to the human logic sometimes. So we will uh, go through these uh, basic rules, these postulates, from engineering point of view. Uh, you are familiar with the uh, phenomenon of classical bit. This is an information containing unit. It can have uh, two logical values, either 0 or 1. I brought here a demonstration device, a 100 forint coin. So it has a head and tail, and it can be regarded as a logical 0 or 1. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a, a, a picture of Claude Shannon, who uh, formulated the, 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 the basics of information theory and defined the so-called uh, Shannon entropy. This is related somehow the information content of a, a classical register or a classical uh, bit. Compared to the classical bit, uh, a quantum bit can be regarded as a flipping coin in the air, which contains or, or, or carries both value at the same time. So you can realize the difference between the mathematicians and engineers, because uh, Professor uh, Neyman and Professor uh, uh, Sass were able to imagine a coin and the two sides had and tear without a, a real coin, but an electrical engineers, we always need something to hold in your hands, and we are convinced only if really flips in the in the air. So, uh, so practically, the first postulate of quantum mechanic uh, uh, formulates or, or or says that a quantum bit can carry two uh, different classical values at the same time. And if we take the second postulate, we can uh, uh, turn to the uh, uh, chess. Uh, both uh, mathematician professors mentioned chess as an important uh, part of the game theory, but it is important from quantum computing as well, because probably you are familiar with the story of the invention of chess. So when the wise man went to the shah that he invented the chess, the shah was uh, really satisfied and asked him what price he would like to get uh, for the chess. And he told, uh, he said that please put one piece of grain one piece of grain on the first field of the chess table, twice as much, two uh, pieces of grain on the second, and he would like to only get the grains on the last field of the chess table. I counted here the uh, uh, top uh, blue number is the number of uh, uh, grains on the last field of the chess table, and uh, this is roughly uh, seven, um, 70 billion tons of grains, which is the, 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 the price of this uh, invention. And the EU production is only 210 billion. Again. So what I would like to emphasize that this exponential uh, uh, calculation or behavior which appears even in the, the quantum mechanics is very important from computing point of view because we can store two values in one quantum bit, we can store four in two quantum bits, and if we consider only 500 quantum bits, 500 electrons or 500 photons, it will contain more numbers than the number of atoms in the whole universe. So it 
suggest that somehow we will be able to store information in a very comprised manner, but not as comprised as you think, because there are some randomness in the quantum uh, mechanics. But anyway, this is a good start to build quantum computers. There is another con consequences of, of uh, merging quantum bits into quantum registers. Uh, Enrico Fermi uh, said that it is worth making experiments because there are two possible outcomes. Either we, uh, the, the result of the measurement confers, confirms the theory or the uh, hypothesis, then we are satisfied that we have a good theory. Or, contrary, if uh, the result is contrary to the hypothesis, then we made a discovery and we can uh, follow the new uh, tracks. So let me make a total experiment. Let me consider two coins. First, we consider them classically. If we have two coins and uh, we flip both coins into the air and let them fall, then we will have uh, four possible, four different uh, final state of the system, either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Compared to this, quantum mechanically, a two qubit quantum register uh, may contain these four states at the same time. Uh, within the blue box, there is the quantum description of a two qubit register, which, uh, which uh, uh, tells that the 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, all these four numbers are stored within the two qubit uh, system. But what if, if we did it two of these four numbers and we use only the cat zero zero and the cat uh, one one, so the classical zero zero and the classical one one value. This can be modeled by a stick which connects or glues the two coins and the coins are rotating together in, in a synchronized uh, ways. In that case, we have two possible outcomes, either 0, 0, or 1, 1. OK. If we do this experiment by two quantum bits, for example, two electrons, then uh, the result will be different. Uh, I explain you this experiment in the following way. We ask Alice. I don't know whether there is Alice in the room or not, but we ask Alice. Thank you. <laughs> so we have a. a <laughs> so we ask, ask her to take one of the, the quantum bits, one of the two electrons, and, and travel to, to Sydney to the Opera House. And we uh, ask uh, uh, Bob to take the other quantum bits and travel to, to New York to the uh, Metropolitan. And exactly at noon, we ask Alice to measure, to check what is the value of his uh, quantum bit. And uh, she can either measure or, or look uh, zero or one, because both values are stored in this composite uh, system. But if Alice measured zero, because the system, the, the, the joint system, has only two possible joint states, zero, zero, or one, one, so if Alice measured zero, then we can be sure that Bob will measure zero, two. If Alice measured one, then we can be sure that Bob me will measure uh, one, two. And this will happen even in the case when the time difference between the two measurements is so small that even the light cannot travel between the two uh, locations. So it seems to be that there is an effect which is faster than light. We learned from the relativity theory that the, the, the speed of light is an upper limit, but, uh, but speaking correctly, it is valid for the information delivery. And in this case, there is no information which is travels between the two uh, points. But this special uh, phenomenon uh, called entanglement, because the two particles, although they are uh, moved in distant places, are in a very strong connection. If we get zero on one place, the other place, uh, on the other place, there will be zero too, and similarly with the ones. How can such strange states generated? This is a 
uh, uh, entanglement generator from the Quantum Information National Laboratory used for free space quantum communications. So on the bottom left, you can see a laser device. The laser beam goes to a special uh, crystal, a uh, lithium neobat crystal, and there are two beams of, of photons <coughs> coming out from these crystals, and these photons are entangled. These, these photons are in special uh, state regarding the polariza polariza polarization. Uh, considering entanglement, it is very interesting and important that if the entanglement is unwanted, so is generated by the nature, then this is the main, main bottleneck of, of quantum computers. Because you can imagine that I have a quantum computer, and within this computer there is an electron uh, whose spin is entangled with another electron uh, in a, a, a butterfly flying uh, outside of the Academy of Sciences. And if we measure the butterfly, then it will influence the operation of my computer. So this is a real uh, problem and a real challenge. On the other side, <coughs> all the actually known quantum algorithms, which are more efficient the, than the classical counterparts, they are using entanglement, but intentionally generated entanglement. So entanglement is a very important resource in quantum computing and communications. So the third postulate describes how the time uh, evolution of quantum systems uh, work. Practically, we can model them similar to the classical digital technologies where we use elementary XOR inverter or other gates. A similar de description exists for the quantum world where we can use, of course, special quantum gates to describe any operation on the quantum bits. And because these uh, quantum bits can be described according to, to uh, von Neumann by unit length vector, therefore, we can visualize the operation of a quantum computer by means of a rotation on the surface of a, a, a sphere which has unit uh, radius. Okay, sorry. The last and fourth postulate is the uh, so-called measurement or, or quantum to classic converter. Unfortunately, during the last several million years of evolution, the human race did not develop any senses for, for the nano world. So no one had the opportunity to see <coughs> an electron or a photon. We try to measure them. We have some information about these elementary particles, but we are not really familiar with its uh, uh, original uh, nature. Therefore, the measurement is very important because it helps us to get information from the quantum level of the, uh, the, the systems. Practically, this is, can be modeled when this coin is flipping in the air. I hit the coin, it will uh, fall down, and either it shows the tail or head. So this is a, practically a, a, a measurement. And, uh, there is a famous uh, thought experiment, uh, probably you heard about that. This is the so-called Schrodinger cat paradox, which is uh, nothing else than if we have a, a quantum world all around, so especially myself, I am consist of plenty of quantum bits. So I can be described by means of a huge, a very huge quantum register, of course. But uh, our experience is that if we go or, or step out from this level of, of, of uh, uh, quantum region towards the classical world, towards the, the, the size of a, a human, this quantum behavior, this quantum properties somehow disappears, and this uh, schrodinger cats paradoxon somehow tries to explain this strangeness. And, uh, and even uh, John von Neumann was really interested because this is uh, somehow related to the philosophy, uh, when and how, how change we for that from quantum to classical. So therefore, he has results on quantum measurement, how to describe or how to dis uh, design measurement 
in quantum system, and this type of measurement is called uh, or named after uh, von Neumann uh, as, as von Neumann measurement, and we teach this measurement technique for students at the uh, university. Okay, so altogether, uh, altogether I listed here the postulates of quantum mechanics in engineering context and listed the formulas, so there are mathematical, mathematical formulation behind uh, these uh, postulates. Now I would like to give you a short uh, history, not quantum mechanics, but uh, for, uh, for the quantum computing and communications. Okay, the starting point in, in my presentation is the fifth uh, Solvay conference. This, is a, this was a conference where scientists were collected, especially physicists who were dealing with the, 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 the quantum mechanics and tried to uh, fi finalize and formalize the rules of the nature in the uh, quantum regime. <coughs> and uh, uh, you know, parallelly, there was another a uh, big effort to describe the large dimension of the universe. How many Nobel laureate did we use to invent or discover the, the rules of the large distances? Okay. One or half, because we, Einstein was the person who, but he received the, the Nobel uh, uh, prize, not for the relativity theory, but the photoelectric uh, effects. On this picture, on the top left, so these uh, are the conference uh, participants. There are 15 Nobel laureates who were worked or related somehow this quantum mechanics. So you can imagine that the intellectual effort which uh, uh, was needed to finalize and, and, and describe the nature at this uh, low level. <coughs> Thanks to John von Neumann, his book was, uh, was mentioned before, there was a, 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 a strict mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, Richard Feynman, who was also a Nobel uh, laureate physicist, uh, was the one who, who published the paper. And he mentioned that maybe it is the time that not only physicists work with uh, the elementary particles, but maybe engineers can think uh, of how to use them for computing. And this was the start of the uh, quest for the quantum computers. There were many ideas how to build or, or what type of, of, of uh, uh, physical objects could be good quantum bits, but it took uh, uh, plenty of time to find appropriate solutions. But in the meantime, mathematicians, engineers were thinking of how to apply, how to use later if we will have real quantum computers. And many algorithms and uh, protocols were born during this period. And even uh, we realized that there is an algorithm called uh, the Shore algorithm, which is able to crack the widely used RSA and public key uh, type of, of security systems. Therefore, <coughs> a new track uh, had been initi initiated, which is the quantum communications. So how can we communicate in a secure way so that even a quantum computer cannot break this code? So one track is this quantum communication. Actually, there are two uh, segments. One is an optical fiber with grand segments or terrestrial segments of quantum communication. And the other is the satellite-based uh, free space segment. And more, uh, around 2018, uh, some uh, computers uh, were published or were accessible. Uh, uh, which we believed that they are more or less really uh, operating in the quantum regime. However, there are true texts even uh, nowadays. One is the quest for the universal quantum computers, which can be programmed to any problem and can solve it very efficiently. And the other track is to develop quantum computers for specific uh, problems. And it is a good question from an engineering point of view. Uh, what type of programming languages are good enough so that the, the, the human logic, which is uh, 
strength, which were strengthened on the, the classic, in the classical world. So how can this logic translate it to the quantum world, which has a bit different uh, system of rules? And similar to the classical info communication, where you uh, realize that a mobile phone is a computer, stronger than the computer which was used to land on the moon. So this is a very serious uh, computer. On the other hand, this is a communication device. So computing and communications integrating uh, during the uh, last several decades. And we expect that uh, uh, in a similar way, quantum computers will be connected so that to, to generate a, a, a higher impact than single standalone computers. The European Union uh, realizing, uh, or realized that uh, uh, a centralized effort is needed in Europe to be compatible or, or, or uh, compatible with, with the, uh, the US or, or, or the Asian countries. Therefore, in 2016, a manifesto, a so-called manifesto, were published, which described six areas of quantum technology, and among these areas uh, there is the quantum computers, the intercity quantum link, the satellite link, and the uh, optical fiber-based quantum uh, internet. Practically, there are four uh, directions, merging directions, communication, computation, simulation, uh, simulation of quantum systems, and sensing as well. And, uh, uh, Taking into account that my time is limited, I brought you only one quantum algorithm to show the, the efficiency of the, the quantum computers, and this is related to this, uh, <coughs> uh, not machine learning, to, to searching and database handling. Okay. Uh, you are familiar with the fact that, uh, fact that we are collecting information every second, terabytes of information are collected from the shops, from the communication network and whatsoever. But this information is useful if we can process this information. And one important problem is the searching, to find a certain element in a very huge database. This problem uh, uh, is as old as the, the human race, because practically the Stone Age uh, people, when they would like to find something to eat, they had to go to the nature, and the nature is practically an unsorted database. They spend plenty of time to find berries and, 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 and animals. Is anyone who knows what is the solution of this problem? Who, to, in, who uh, did the, the, the Stone Age people improve the efficiency? Sorry? Uh, yes, but I have a more general answer. This is agriculture and, and animal husbandry, because if you need a sheep, go to the shepherd. If you need an apple, go to the apple garden. And uh, if you need a car, go to the garage and, and, and so on. So practically, from a computer science point of view, agriculture and animal husbandry means sorting the database. And uh, for the past 10 uh, uh, millennia, we did the same. We always sort, 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 sort. Maybe you have the experience when you visit a large shopping mall or a hypermarket. After several visits, you find the bread, the milk, and what you would like to get. But next time to, you, uh, next time to go to the shop, suddenly this sorted in your mind database, becomes unsorted, because the guys who run this uh, uh, shopping uh, mall uh, move to different locations, the goods. Therefore, you need to spend more time. They decrease your efficiency to find the goods in the shopping mall. So they make the, the database unsorted. Fortunately, there is a quantum algorithm which is able to find a certain element in an unsorted database. So there is no need for sorting. This is called the uh, Grover algorithm. Here you can see on the uh, left-hand side this 
block diagram of this algorithm, or this, uh, we, can, we call it uh, Grover operator. On the right hand side, uh, it shows that this is practically nothing else than rotating the index vector of the database to a, the appropriate uh, position. And the efficiency of this algorithm scales with the square root of the size of the uh, database. <coughs> However, from engineering point of view, the finding an element is important, but not so important. What is important to finding the smallest or the largest element in, in a database? Because typically, we engineers optimize so-called goal functions, and we would like to find the optimum solution for a, a, a problem. Therefore, there is, this is a, a, a result from this Quantum Inter Information National Lab. Uh, uh, we had a modified uh, uh, algorithm called quantum existence testing, which is able to f uh, decide very efficiently whether a certain element is contained uh, by the database or not. And uh, uh, if we combine this quantum algorithm, this quantum existence testing, with classical logarithmic search, which itself is very efficient for sorted databases, then, in that case, here there is a, a, an animation how it works. So we can find very quickly, sorry, very quickly the smallest value in the in, in, in the database. So this is a I say uh, uh, I'm saying as a beautiful result because we had a very quick classical algorithm, but it were uh, it is not able to be used on, on unsorted databases, but involving a quantum solution and combining them, we can <coughs> provide a, 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 a quantum assisted solution to this problem. Okay. Here, uh, with my uh, PhD student, made some uh, calculations or, or tested the efficiency of this algorithm. Uh, probably you know that actually nowadays big server farms are used to collect the, the data and run different processes. So they collect the information, the, the, the data uh, from all over the world, make the processing and, and send back the information or the, the, the results. And uh, on this uh, figure, you can see the blue one is, uh, represents the, a, a classical solution, and the red one is the, the, the quantum assisted solution to this uh, problem. If you are interested how to imagine a, a quantum bit, there are several promising solutions. One could be the, the, the usage of the spin of an electron. This is a magnetic uh, property. So an electromagnetic field, by means of an electromagnetic field, we can uh, set up the quantum bit in a, in a, a superposition uh, state. So it can contain an upwards and downwards state of a, the spin at the same time. Uh, the problem of this uh, uh, approach is that, that uh, it is very uh, uh, sensitive for the uh, environmental noise. And uh, practically, we would like to build several thousand qubit uh, long or large uh, quantum processors. Therefore, it seems that this type of approach is good for uh, proving uh, the concept, but not good for the, the everyday use. Another possibility, the so-called Cooper pairs, the su superconducting uh, electron pairs, uh, uh, they are very good or, 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 or appropriate solution to store quantum information. The only requirement is that the device has to be cooled down near to zero Kelvin. So the device itself is like, like a melon and uh, uh, everything which provides this, the, the frigator is like a, a room. Okay, another uh, possible solution is the, the ion uh, trap, where ions are uh, uh, stored or, or, or carried in, in a, uh, again, in electromagnetic field, and the energy level of these uh, ions carries the, the quantum information. And the last but not least solution is the photonic quantum computers. Uh, uh, these are very promising and as a new approach because uh, photons are very resistive against entanglement, so uh, they are very solid and good, good quantum bits. The only problem that photons like travel with the speed of light, so it is hard to keep them in a certain location. 
And uh, uh, here there is a, a figure about the different potential technologies of quantum computers. And I put this uh, yellow dashed line. This is the, the Moore's law in the quantum regime. It is called Rowe's law because uh, uh, and after uh, another scientist. But uh, you can observe that there are certain technologies which may probably <coughs> continue uh, the, the, the Moore's law in, for quantum computers as well. Of course, there are uh, so-called uh, sure bet technologies. Probably they will be the winner of this competition, but we are not sure. There are several ones which are risky or, 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 or less uh, reliable. Uh, I take among them uh, one, which is the, this is the IBM's quantum computer. I prefer it from educational point of view because, because they made uh, publicly available uh, of the uh, small qubit quantum processor. So uh, even uh, undergraduate students from the university can write uh, uh, codes and programs on the processor, send to the cloud, and they run this code on this processor. So you can uh, follow here the uh, different dates and the different uh, numbers of uh, qubits. This is an exponential increase in the number of qubits. Of course, these are the, the so-called classical qubits and the really useful operational qubits which can be used for computation is the its, its number is, is, is smaller. So, but we think that Moore's law is still uh, alive in, in the quantum regime. And here, uh, I would like to only highlight how many companies, different companies, are working on quantum uh, computing, different aspects, of course, computers, programming, applications, uh, and so on. From computer science point of view, if you would like to write a, a quantum algorithm, which is more efficient than the classical counterparts, uh, more or less, it seems to be easy, because every quantum algorithm contains an initialization which can be written in uh, several rows in a, a program, so it is a very clear and easy job. To define the parallel computation of the quantum computers, it is more or less easy, so after some practicing you can do this. You can construct measurement, thanks to von uh, uh, Neumann, and sometimes we need post-processing to, to evaluate or understand the, the, the results, but the really challenge is the so-called amplitude amplification, which makes the originally inherent randomness in the quantum regime uh, more or less deterministic. So it influences or modifies the probabilities in the quantum regime so that if we make a measurement, the appropriate answer will be uh, uh, get. And here is an example from Microsoft. This is QSharp for a, a, a quantum code. And this is the IBM's Qiskit, which is a Python-based uh, quantum programming uh, language. And some uh, results and interesting about quantum communications. The most famous communication protocol is teleportation, uh, not because we would like to teleport anyone in this room or, or later in the future, but from information theory point of view, the teleportation is nothing else than an entanglement assisted. This means that we use entangled quantum bits for uh, assist the communication. So this is an entanglement assisted transmission of quantum states over classical channels. So it makes it possible that we use uh, classical commercial optical fibers to deliver quantum information. So it is the real importance of, of uh, the, the teleportation. And as I mentioned in the, uh, earlier, so the aim of, of, of quantum communication is to connect quantum computers and sensors in a large network. And the so-called killer application, the first application which is actually under spreading all around the world, is the so-called quantum key distribution. This is the Gartner hype curve. Quantum uh, uh, key distribution means that we encode uh, classical information into non-orthogonal quantum bits. And thanks to this encoding, if anyone tries to get information from the channel, we can reveal this eavesdropping uh, uh, event. The other item on this curve is the post-quantum cryptography. 
this means classical efforts to find such classical uh, ciphering algorithms which are uh, uh, resistive against the quantum computers. But because we don't know what are the limitations of a quantum computer, we cannot say that an uh, algorithm really resistive against the quantum uh, attack. Okay, here is an optical fiber uh, which is used for uh, terrestrial quantum communications. Uh, for the sake of comparison, this uh, uh, diagonal black strip is uh, a uh, hair, uh, uh, a strand of hair, and the red one is the core. This is the real part of that, so the optical part of the cable which is used, and we send photons into this uh, small optical or narrow optical cables, not as a bunch of photons as in classical communications, but one by one, and modify the polarization of the photons one by one, and this carries the uh, information. The other segment, as I mentioned, the satellite segment, this is a Chinese uh, satellite. It was launched two years ago and made a connection between uh, Graz in Austria and, and uh, uh, a city in, in, in China and demonstrated that quantum information can be delivered by these two distant uh, points. ESA, the European Space Agency, plans to launch the European quantum capable uh, satellites within three or four years and uh, uh, we plan to deploy a, a receiver station here in Hungary. This is the Hungarian results. Uh, last year, we uh, de uh, deployed a, a testbed in Budapest. It had, a, a, on the right-hand side, a free space uh, optical link between the uh, building of uh, the Budapest University of Technology and the opposite side of the Danube, uh, of the, uh, there is a building of, of Vodafone. So it was roughly a one kilometer long uh, free space optical communication uh, test. And the other was uh, towards the Wigner Institute of Physics uh, in Chilabertz. This is roughly 10 kilometers, but we use the commercial cable, optical cable of the Hungarian Telecom. So, and this is uh, uh, two devices of the, the, the fiber-based quantum communication uh, system. These were developed at the department of, uh, at, so at the department, uh, at the faculty of electrical engineering and informatics, together with the uh, colleagues from Wigner and the, uh, the faculty of, of natural sciences in, in at the Budapest University of Technology. And what we are doing uh, now, we are working on the Hungarian backbone of the uh, a quantum network. Uh, we are good progress towards uh, Brat uh, Pozsony, Bratislava, and, and Vienna uh, Beach, and uh, uh, there are several other directions towards Beach, Szeged, and uh, maybe uh, Miskolc, uh, so that big Hungarian cities will be connected by means of uh, quantum devices. This is supported partly by the European Union, partly by the Hungarian government, and uh, next year there will be a call for the cross-connection of the national uh, networks in order to implement the pan-European quantum uh, communication uh, network. So, as a summary, uh, uh, I presented you that we started as engineers roughly after 1930 when uh, the, the, the postulates and description of quantum mechanics had been uh, formulated. John von Neumann had important role uh, in this formalization, especially according to the, the, the mathematic description of the quantum postulates and, and operation. But the real work with the, the elementary particles from engineering point of view started around 1990. In uh, 2010 uh, is the year of the first successful communication experience. 15 is the commercial quantum uh, communication devices. And uh, around 22, there are uh, quantum computers. I brought here mainframe, similar to the classical big computers, which has distant access and can run uh, difficult problems. And uh, the novelties are the, the small case quantum networks, which will be later interconnected. And I started with uh, the 
walnut tree of, of uh, John von Neumann, and I would like to finish my talk also with him. Uh, every uh, last uh, lecture of uh, uh, my course is on quantum technology, uh, is uh, uh, held in, in, in the nature. There is a statue of, of von Neumann roughly 200 meters away from our uh, building. We go there with the students and I tell them the story of, of quantum mechanics and quantum uh, technology and I highlight the Hungarian participants of this process, among them of course John von Neumann. So thank you very much for your audience. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. We learn from, from Professor Rédei presentation that Neumann has two sides. One is a, one is a mathematician, the other engineering, and it was important your presentation because they show the, the engineering heritage of the, of the phenomenon. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So much. Okay. Thank you.